yeah. we're just we're just starting. So oh, now I'm no, oh, I'm so sorry. My audio just uh, failed, and I had to reboot my computer. So I'm sorry okay, for. Yes. Okay. So, but but you can control the time for Toru. Then he's just starting now. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can I start? Yes, please. Yes, go, ahead. Okay, yes. go ahead. Uh, 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 first, uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me uh, to give a talk in this conference. Uh, now, uh, today I will talk uh, about uh, one of a key in open swimming field theory. And uh, maybe uh, I should, uh, or I can, uh, to. Yes, and, um, it's one of the in Witten's open swing with theory. Um, First let, uh, first, let us explain what is K. Uh, K is lying integral of uh, T3 uh, energy moment, world sheet, world sheet energy moment tensor in the silver coordinate. And silver coordinate is uh, defined by uh, this mapping. And uh, this is another picture for the uh, silver coordinate. Silver coordinate is uh, uh, this coordinate. Oh. And K is uh, defined uh, as a line integral of TZ in this coordinate. And uh, this uh, infinite cone, a cone of infinite height. And uh, why it is interesting? Uh, because uh, one of the K may be related to uh, possible underlying geometry of Witten's open SFT. And uh, we also expect that uh, one of the K is also uh, useful to get a new expression for uh, scattering amplitude. So uh, this is the outline of my talk. Uh, first, uh, I will explain uh, overview, historical overview of one of the K, and uh, uh, then I will explain uh, one of the uh, relation of one of the K and uh, S matrix. And I, I plan to uh, talk uh, about one of the K and the classical solution, but today I quit to take up this yeah, and this subject because uh, 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 because conclu uh, result is not conclusive yet. Uh, so uh, mainly I will talk about uh, S matrix uh, S matrix uh, subject subjects of S matrix and uh, and, and then. Uh, then, uh, uh, then I will start uh, the historical overview of the Van uh, 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 One of the key appeared. Uh, um, one of the key appeared uh, in the discussion of classical solutions uh, and uh, uh, classical solutions in. Witten's open SFT is uh, always uh, always written as a pure gauge formally. Uh, it is realized by uh, many people. And, uh, and, 
And then、uh, one of the cases also appeared in the multi-shinable solution. And multi-shinable solution is、uh, a classical solution. And、uh, uh, I will explain later. And、uh, one of the cases also appeared in the three level S, S,、uh, a formula for three level S matrix. And、uh, one of the cases also appeared in unconventional propagator. So, Uh, classical solutions are、uh, always written as a pure gauge、uh, formally、uh, if we use one of a k. And、uh, if psi is not a pure gauge solution,、uh, one of a k appears in U or U inverse. In, a, in other words, one of a k is regarded as a singular object and、uh, This singularity symbolizes the non triviality of the classical solution. And、uh, why one of a k is considered to be singular? Because one of a k, is,、uh, one of a k cannot be expressed as a superposition of wedge states.、Uh, uh, uh, I will explain what is a wedge state later.、Um, usually, a、uh, function of k is defined as a Superposition of wedge states. And、uh, many of the expressions with、uh, one of a k in this talk is very formal.、Uh, for, for example, formally written as pure gauge does, does not mean pure gauge. And I hope that、uh, after good understanding,、uh, we will be able to distinguish between correct expression and uh, uh, inappropriate expressions with one of a k. And that is also、uh, one of the, my goals I would like to understand. And one of Bakke also appears in、uh, homotopy states,、uh, which represents、uh, emptiness of the physical excita excitation around the classical solution.、Uh, it is formally、uh, defined by the state.、Uh, And when q psi acts on a psi,、uh, the result is、uh, identity. And q psi is a、uh, BRST operator around the classical solution defined by this expression. This, this expression. And、uh, if such a psi exists、uh, as a re regular state,、uh, there are no open string excitation around the psi. So this means、uh, psi. So it's a t a k e m p a k e m solution. And if SI exists only formally, the physical p u s l i n g excitation around the side.、Uh, an example is that、uh, B over K,、uh, if, if we act、uh, Q to the state,、uh, formal state、uh, B over K,、uh, the result is one. And later, uh, uh, Murata and Shinabu used、uh, one of a k to construct a、uh, classical solution.、Uh, classical solution for、uh, classical solution for uh, multi brain, a、uh, multiple deep brain system.、Uh, they are also almost a solution, but not rigorously realized, realized so far. Uh, they, uh, Desirable energy and the energy、uh, LD invariant are, ob are obtained by using some regularization, but、uh, EOM is a slightly broken. And、uh, there is also a difficulty in n l a r g e r than 2. n l a r g e r than 2, these two properties are, and, and, this, and this property, energy and energy is. Uh, also, uh, also difficult for n l a r g e r than 2. But recently,、uh, some progress, but、uh, EOM, EOM is st still broken. And, uh, sorry. Uh, this, this, is, uh, uh, this is a slide to explain KBC and uh, uh, 
registrate. Registrate is uh, e to a k. Uh, and K KBC uh, satisfied uh, these algebras uh, and the uh, star multiplication. Uh, that means that uh, the product here is star product. Uh, 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 let me skip this, this slide. And uh, uh, there are uh, another context. Uh, uh, recently, uh, I and uh, Hiroaki Matsunaga uh, find a uh, formula for S matrix around the classical solution by using classical solution and uh, uh, tachyon vacuum solution. Tachyon vacuum solution is just, uh, just a reference. So input is uh, external states, in external states and tachyon vacuum, and uh, also classical solution. And typically this, uh, this expression, in this expression, S matrix is, uh, written by, by using one over k. And in, oh, oh, and in the previous paper, we showed that the calculation of n equal four and, and uh, proved that uh, the result is, result agrees with the S matrix. But we, we have not uh, provided uh, general proof for general n. And uh, in this calculation, we, uh, it seems that uh, we can deal with one over k very nicely. And, and uh, later, we also uh, propose a gauge fixing condition for a final rule with very un unconventional, unconventional propagator PM, which also uses one over k. Uh, this P, uh, this propagator is derived by using homological perturbation lemma, but uh, a part of assumption is not justified. Uh, maybe this uh, here should be equal, but uh, some, apart, some assumption is not, uh, not fully justified. So its theoretical ground is not complete yet. But uh, it also uh, reproduce it is a matrices, it's matrices. And apparently uh, it looks different from uh, I, I psi. So uh, uh, here is a uh, uh, solution and uh, uh, people, uh, people try to understand winding number or geometry. And uh, here is another context. Uh, a new, new formula for uh, three level S matrix and uh, unusual R propagator, uh, we, 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 uh, we found this. But uh, equivalence is not, not clear and uh, uh, proof for General N is lacking, and uh, uh, theoretical ground for this, uh, this this propagator, this uh, gauge condition is not complete. So there are many expectations uh, around the band of okay, our conjecture or okay, yes. So, so uh, as today. Uh, we will show that uh, this part and uh, equivalence of this. Uh, and uh, in future direction, uh, uh, we, uh, we are now working on to uh, derive some prescription to uh, deal with one of K and uh, it can be used to uh, I, I expect it can be used to study multi-level solution, but I don't talk much about this today. Uh, 
this is the uh, uh, introduction. And uh, then I will explain uh, our formula, our formula for S matrix. Uh, it, it looks like this. Uh, here, uh, W psi is uh, defined by this combination, and AT is a uh, homotopy state for token banking solution. And A is defined by AT minus A psi. And for Schnabel solution, uh, W psi is uh, just a wedge state, and uh, A is written like this. And OJ is external state. And uh, this summation is a symmetrization of these, uh, these legs and these indices. Uh, uh, an example for uh, in, uh, five point function is uh, written like this. And we call these terms uh, rich in, in here after. And uh, we proved that uh, I psi n is S matrix by using uh, by using the Feynman rules in uh, Feynman rules in the dress visual gauge. And uh, dress visual gauge is a singular gauge condition in the sense that the propagators do not uh, generate propagation of the open string midpoint but it can be used for three-level calculation. And also, uh, for loop-level calculation, we can also use it with uh, suitable uh, regularization, regularization. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, if, we, if, if we consider it as a, a limit of a class of regular gauge, gauge conditions, uh, we can use that. And, uh, now we will review uh, the dress basal gauge. The uh, dress basal gauge is uh, given by this condition, and uh, BFG is uh, given by uh, this expression. And we also define LFG by this. And B, B0 uh, minus is defined by this combination and L0 minus is this combination. And uh, uh, here, here, uh, here is the rules for, for action on the KBC states. And for f equal g equal uh, e to k, k over 2, then uh, this gauge condition reduces to uh, the Schnabel gauge uh, because uh, it, it's, not, it's tricky, but uh, bfg reduces to b0 and lfg reduces to l0. And uh, propagator in this gauge is uh, given by uh, given uh, uh, we, we we use this simplified propagator uh, and this propagator is incomplete because it is it violates the VPG property. And uh, a true propagator is given by this. But we proved that uh, we can use this simplified propagator for three level, on shape three level uh, calculations. So in the following, uh, we will use this propagator. And physical state in this, uh, physical state in this condition is Ah, okay. Uh, physical state in this condition. Physical state 
in this case, it's given by this. And in terms of uh, W and A, uh, it's given by this expression. And, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, this is a notation for our final rules. And uh, the relation to uh, relation between a final rule and uh, uh, routines are given by this. Uh, this is the uh, uh, important formula. Uh, Tn is uh, a uh, symmetric combination of uh, and, and, uh, a symmetric combination of uh, partial, fine, partial Feynman diagrams. Uh, it's uh, for n equals three. It's given by this. And, and the derivation for this pro this formula for n equal to is given by this. Okay. And uh, 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 in this calculation, uh, we only obtained uh, a t term and uh, a psi to obtain a psi term. Uh, we need to use this regularized uh, propagator for uh there's to be the gauge and uh, we uh, and this term uh, it corresponds to the regularization time of the and the propagator of the speed of gauge And, and then uh, by using this formula, we can uh, convert uh, Feynman diagrams into uh, routines or routines into Feynman di diagrams. And then by using combinatorial uh, discussion, uh, we can prove that uh, our formula hypothesis is not X. And uh, then uh, I will explain the unconventional propagator. Uh, unconventional propagator is uh, given by this expression. Uh, and uh, this looks very, uh, very different from uh, conventional propagator, but, uh, but, but uh, for on shape three amplitude, uh, we proved that this reproduces uh, correct and S matrix. Uh, for example, uh, uh, this dia diagram, uh, in this diagram, uh, uh, A comes here, or uh, for this propagator, A comes here or here, and for this propagator A comes here or here. So, uh, uh, so uh, uh, there are three possibilities because uh, if, if uh, S A is squared to zero, so there, there are three possibilities and uh, it, it will produce uh, these terms. The notable feature of this Feynman group is that most of Feynman diagrams punish except, except for these uh, two types. And uh, thanks to this uh, property, we can explicitly uh, calculate the sum. And yeah, this is the result. And, and uh, again, uh, by technical uh, discussion, we can show that the result is an uh, S matrix. Uh, so uh, uh, let me conclude the talk. Uh, uh, now, uh, now we prove, uh, prove that uh, the formula is S matrix and uh, Maybe uh, this unconventional propagator might be uh, might, uh, might be ju uh, just uh, 
uh, this unusual propagator works for three-level S matrix. And then uh, next we ne uh, ne uh, next thing uh, we would like to study is uh, the, uh, this part, a uh, theoretical ground of uh, this uh, unusual propagator. Uh, and this is related to study uh, study the kernel of one of a k. So uh, if we if we can study uh, understand uh, the kernel of one of a k uh, very well, uh, we can we can give uh, theoretical, theoretical ground for this uh, gauge condition and propagators, and uh, it uh, it should be. It should be uh, generalized to the loop level uh, formula, and we also expect that uh, we can read some prescription one of one of a k or definition of one of a k, and uh, it can be used to study uh, multi-channel solution. Uh, uh, I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Toru, uh, for this uh, inspiring talk. So are there any questions? We have about three, four minutes for, for discussion. So I so can't. Jakub has a question. Jakub, OK. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes. Hi, Toro. Very nice talk. Uh, so uh, my question is about your propagators, both about the unconventional one and the one in the dressed B0 gauge. So uh, did you think at all about their, uh, about interpreting them uh, in terms of contacting homotopy operators? And if so, what would be the corresponding projector which would enter the hochko daira decomposition? Ah, uh, okay. Uh, maybe uh, it's related to uh, maybe it's related to this part. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, maybe I have. I know how. Uh, no. Oh. Uh, this is all the paper. <laughs> Okay, so okay. is that your notes or? <laughs> I see, okay, so yeah, okay. there I can. So what is this W in 4.32? Okay. Uh, so, so a, co a convention is a, a little different. different. Uh, maybe minus sign is uh, different from my talk, but okay. Then maybe we can have a discussion privately. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. Are there other talks like uh, other questions? Wow, I, I I don't hear anyone. So well, so maybe Toru, uh, you showed some uh, explicit formulas uh, using the bino binomial coefficients. Uh, I missed uh, what it was describing exactly. Uh, it was some ampl amplitude. It was the five point amplitude or. Uh, so sorry, I don't understand your question. Yeah, yeah. What, what are these? Uh, what are these uh, formulas that you are showing on this slide? This. 
Oh, no, no, I meant the numerical things. So, so this is the five point amplitude. So, so it's just the number or because you're showing numbers without any momenta, momentum dependence. Uh, Oh, uh, um, uh, I proved that uh, this expression it is equivalent to uh, uh, S matrix calculated, calculated by dressed Bezier gauge. Mm -hmm. uh, no, uh, Bezier gauge. I see. And uh, at the end, th th this is a rule. And this this is five uh this is uh, uh, uh this is symmetric sum of uh sub diagrams of Feynman five, five diagram mm -hmm. and this uh, this quantity is defined by w and a so uh so uh by using this formula, uh, you, you can convert uh, these, uh, our formula to Feynman diagrams. Okay. Okay, I think uh, I can ask more uh, detailed question in private. So okay. I think now uh, we have time to move uh, to the other talk by, uh, by Ivo Sachs. And Ivo will tell us about type two supergravity from the spinning road line. Can you hear us, yep. Ivo? Can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Wonderful, perfect. All right, so well, let me first thank the organizer for this wonderful online conference. I appreciate it a lot. Um, so this talk is going to be about how, how much information about string field theory can we extract from just the spinning world line. So replace the world sheet by just the world line. Now, the uh, motivation for this is basically comes from this idea that the classical string field theory, a truly background independent string field theory should be formulated as a theory of background fields. So we should get equations for the background fields. Now, this we can do for the point particle, for the word line, but of course we cannot do this for the, for the word sheet. So that is one of the motivations to look at this word line. And the other motivation is to better understand the relation with the, uh, the ambitwister string, which is in, somehow also is supposed to be just a point particle theory in disguise, but in a, in a smart parameterization. However, I should say that really the the start of this, the starting with this approach was about four years ago in Sao Paulo when we were sitting in a, in, a, in a restaurant and having dinner for the last, during the last string filtering conference. And I asked Nathan uh, what, if, what, what, what was the vertex operator for the spin connection or for the Christoffel symbol in string theory. And then he suggested to me that perhaps one should look at the point particle first. So thanks Nathan for that hint. Now, unfortunately we won't have dinner tonight together, but hopefully again soon. But so the work I will be talking about today is, is some papers which I've written with uh, Roberto Bonetti and Adiel Meyer. So that is this is about. So but now let me let me try to describe a little bit the structure of, of, of this whole theory or the, the idea behind it. So I want to start with the, with the BV formulation. So I want to start with a generic BV system. So a generic BV system should be described by some space graded space of fields. And we have a BV operator and we have some action functional in this space of fields. So that would be sort of the way one would like, could describe a BV system generally. Now, once we have this BV operator, this induces together with the action functional that gives, uh, that induces a homological vector field on this space of fields. That's this omega. So that is this PSD vector field or some homological vector field. Now, now this, this vector field vanishes at the critical point of the action. And so if we take a solution of the classical equation of motion, the, this vector field will vanish. So we can expand it around any critical point, any classical solution. So if we do this, we expand it on the tangent space to the, to the field space at this critical point, and we get this expansion. 
terms or coefficients, you know, coefficients perhaps in a good way, maps. Yeah? So these are maps from the tangent space or tensor product of one tangent space into itself. This is what's uh, often now referred to as the Z infinity algebra, which we've heard lots about in this theory, but I don't want to, in, the, in this, during this meeting, I don't want to say anything about this. I just want to say this is where string field theory lives. So string field, these omega k's, these expansion coefficients are the vertices of a string field theory, or in fact, any theory, perturbative theory that's expanded around a critical point. So once we have these vertices, we can do Feynman perturbation theory and we can compute the S-matrix elements. So it's also now often referred to as this minimal model. And that is where string theory lives, perturbative string theory, the word sheet theory. So this talk really is about going the other direction. We want to go, we would like to go from here to here. We would like to recover the whole logical vector field. And of course, ideally even a BB action, but that we will not be able to do, but we can go somewhere in this direction. Now, for the string, we cannot do this, but for the point particle, you can at least to some extent, and that's what I want to describe. Now, the, the other motivation, as I said, had to do with the ambitwister string. With the ambitwister string is somehow a very smart way of summing up all the Feynman diagrams and representing the S matrix, S matrices that come from it in terms of a, a, a conformal field theory. So, but on the other hand, we know that the, it, there's only the graviton in there or the young wheels field, depending on what you do. So it's also really a point particle theory. So it'd be nice to understand precisely what's the connection. Now, on the twister string actually is a, is, a, is, a, is a string theory, but nevertheless is another theory where you can go from here to here. And there was a very nice paper a few years ago by Adamo, Ghazali and Skinner, where they actually coupled this um, ambitwister string to generic background fields. And you can do that in the ambitwister string. You don't have this problem of conformal invariance. And they obtained the type two supergravity equations of motion in the background independent way. So here we go somehow not further because we, we get rid of this conformal filter representation. We go really to the word line. So in, in a way, perhaps one should get the same thing. And that's what we want to see. So, so that's the, the setup. Now, the result, let me then state the result. So the result which we get is that as a theory of massless background fields, the spinning world line, so with world line supersymmetry, is almost as rigid as string theory. So we get almost as many constraints in the background fields as we would get from string theory for the massless Levi Schwartz sector fields. Here we're just looking at the bosonic fields. So that's the first result. The second result is that there is a version of an operator state correspondence in this theory. So that might come as a little bit of a surprise because we always think that conformal symmetry is important, but it turns out one can have an operator state correspondence even in this world line theory. So these are the two things which I'd like to describe. Now, let me then introduce the model. So the model is this word line, this is well known. Then here we have the super partner to the X dot or on the P. So the Hamiltonian, then we have the, again, the superpartners. So these are the word line fermions. And here are the Gravitini, so the superpartner to the, uh, the Einbein, which would have reparameterization invariance. So we use a, a so we, we use, um, we have an n equal four, we take n equal four word line supersymmetry, but we compose it into uh, two complex fermions. So I goes from one to two, but we have then the theta and the theta bar. So, they, if in, in, in the sense of string theory, these two would correspond to the two lowest modes of the, the world sheet fermions. If you just take the psi plus minus a half, and since we are in the closed string, also the, the, the chiral and the antichiral piece, they correspond to this n equal four uh, multiplet. So that's the model which we want to analyze. Now, let me give a little bit of history, just a little bit to see um, what, you know, why one would do that. So the n equals zero, so no supersymmetry word line has been analyzed many times. And in particular, there was a paper by Seagal, Arkady Seagal, I think about 20 years ago, where he showed that the, the, back, the theory of background fields is that of off-shell conformal gravity. So while transformations are a gauge symmetry and there are no equations on the background. So there's no equations of motion. Then there was a very nice paper about 10 years ago, a little bit more, by Dai Huang and Siegel, Warren Siegel, and um, there they analyzed the n equal two word line, the n equal two word line supersymmetry. And what they showed is that the closure or nil potency of the BRSD charge implies the Young-Wheels equation of motion. So it's actually a little bit tricky, but we will just see how, how it goes. And then this talk is really about the n equal four extension of this. So we get 
then the equations of motion for the and the Nebel Schwarz Nebel Schwarz fields, massless Nebel Schwarz fields of type two string theory. So to see how this BRSD charge, so really what we will uh, impose is that the BRSD charge squares to zero. That will be our uh, equation of motion. So how does that connect to what I had before when I expanded the homological vector field omega, which comes with every BV action. So this always squares to zero by construction, but we expand it, but so we can expand it the linear, uh, the zero four term linear term. This is really the BRSD charge is a linear term of this expansion which is a map from the tangent space to the tangent space, and then you get the higher order terms as well. So omega square, that gives you comp composition of omega zero with omega two, but also omega one squared and other terms. Now, this is PRSD charge squared. This squares to zero precisely when the equation of motions are satisfied, so omega zero has to vanish, means you have to be at the critical point. So that's just to put this in the context. So that's what I'm saying here. Okay, so we're going to analyze this. So if this squares to zero, then we know the equation of motion is satisfied, but we don't need to assume any background to start off. So the BRS, now I, I just wrote the Q rather than the QBRSD, and I just write the expansion, which I'm sure is known to many people. It's just the usual C times uh, momentum Hamiltonian. Then we have the supercharges here, the world line supercharges coming together with the ghosts, the super ghosts, and then the extra term. So this is this linear operator which acts on the tangent space at any point to the space of fields. So this is a linear operator which acts in some Hilbert space and the Hilbert space is given by the space of functions together with the Clifford algebra that is generated by the, the FIDAS, so the world line fermions, together with the ghosts and super ghosts which give a Weyl algebra. So a generic state is going to be a polynomial in theta, the, the, the world line fermions, the ghosts, the anti-ghosts, and then with coefficients, which are functions. So one would like Q to act on this space. However, this space turns out is much too big. If you take this big, this big space, you will get nowhere. You will get no background fields. All background fields will be set to zero. You have no, there's no coupling. So the way to see that is perhaps, let's go to the Dirac quantization first rather than BRST. So let's forget about the posts and just look at, um, then we only have the, the world line fermions to generate states. A generic state will be a function then of x and the thetas, and will be like this, will look like this. It will be in some, um, um, so you have the one, is one and two, remember, are the, the two SU2 labels, which come from the SO4 uh, R symmetry. Now, this is by, so as I said, if you try to have Q squared to zero in such a space, you will never get zero unless you set all the background fields to zero. But it turns out we can reduce the Hilbert space as we in fact do it all the time by gauging some of the subgroups of the SO4 R symmetry, which we have in this theory. So, so take a generic state of this type, and now you start say, do a minimal gauging where you just gauge two U1 symmetries, two U1 subgroups of SO4, then this young structure is reduced to just box times box. This actually has an interpretation in string theory, which we know, which is one corresponds that you have the same number of boxes here and here. It's what we call level matching. And there is also uh, one that you have only one box, which actually corresponds to level truncation. So we take the low, lowest truncation. So this is something we're actually familiar with. We can also do that in string theory, not just in the world line. But then we can do more. There are more subgroups of SO4. So that would be a, mi a minimal gauging, which we will look at. But you can, there's also the Young symmetrizer, which interchanges two of the thetas. If you do that, you get um, that corresponds, that further reduces to symmetric representations. So it particularly gets rid of the Calbremont field, something in string theory we are also aware of that we can do by using um, unoriented strings. But you can do more. There's a trace generator also in SO4, which in fact gets, um, removes the trace of this uh, symmetric tensor. Uh, this one has no interpretation in string theory, but corresponds to eliminating the dilaton. So we see already at the level of the spectrum, this theory has some um, features of string theory, but you have a little bit more freedom that you can actually eliminate the, the dilaton. Now, a generic state, say for instance, suppose we do this maximal gauging, impose all of these projections, then the only the graviton is left, nothing else. The graviton cannot never be gauged away, it will always be there. So the graviton is here, that's a generic state that's left. Then this is the trace, the graviton. Here you have some auxiliary fields 
And here is the diffeomorphism ghost is given here. So that has ghost number minus one. So this state has ghost number zero. This has ghost number minus one. This will play an important role later in the operator state correspondence. So there is there, and then these are the corresponding anti-fields. So that's the cohomology of Q once you impose all these restrictions. This is the maximal gauging. All right, so this is the, let's now see if we couple this theory to background fields. So first I want to take this minimal gauging that is indicated here, just the two U1s. And then let me see the supercharges in the BRSD um, charge, how they get modified. We, this is something we're familiar with. We can add a spin connection. We can add an anti-symmetric tensor here, which is the field strength of the Calvary-Mont field. I put a twiddle here just to indicate that this is a, a chiral coupling. And so left and right movers couple differently. Left and right movers in SU2, SO4 means the two SU2 subgroups that enter it. They are treated differently. And here is the coupling to the dilaton. So it's interesting. This is more or less, you can just look at the string theory book and see that you can sort of guess how you would couple such a thing. And this similarly, if you look at the string theory book, you sort of come quickly with this idea that this should couple. The dilaton, it's much less clear how one would actually couple the dilaton to the word line. In fact, one might even think it shouldn't couple at all because after all, we think that the, dila the dilaton couples to the anomaly of the, of the ghost current, which is certainly not there. So, but nevertheless, the dilaton can couple, but there was no guide actually to find it. It was just a trial of error, trial and error that we ended up with this, in, with this way of coupling it. So it's some sort of like an imaginary vector potential. And then there's the Hamiltonian, which is the, the covariant derivative squared, and you have some non-minimal couplings, which appear, which again, they're perhaps not too surprising apart from perhaps the dilaton part. And then there's one more extra thing. You can add a cosmological constant. So, in, in the word line, contrary to the string theory, you can add a, a coupling like this, which will result in a cosmological constant. So you can put this theory in a background, which um, is the sitter, anti the sitter of flat. Now, but you can only do that provided you project out the, um, the, the Calvary-Mont field. So you have to do the sort of um, unoriented theory, if you wish, in terms of string theory. But then, you, the, so there is again a place where the word line is a little bit more flexible. Okay, so, so that is what I'm saying here. In contrast to string theory, but not the ambit with the string, this construction is background independent. So we didn't assume that we expand around any background. So we just, these are, there's, there's no background dependence here. It's manifestly background independent. Also, it's interesting that the B mu nu field appears, but doesn't couple to any string. It just couples to the word line. This is something which is always assumed, it seems, in these spontane conjectures. Um, and as I said before, um, that the, um, this cosmological constant is in contradiction with the existence of a Calvary-Mont field. But that's the structure. So now you want the Q BSD to square to zero. We want to see what are the equations implied by Q squaring to zero. So you get two terms, you get terms from commutator of the supercharges, and then you get the, the commutator of the supercharge with the Hamiltonian. Usually this one is a, a sort of automatic because once you have, since this gives the Hamiltonian, the Jacobi identities would imply the latter. However, here is not like that because you have to reduce. You see, we have to, we can, the, if you commute the, the charges with each other, you get some terms which may be zero on the reduced Hilbert space, but may not be zero on the big Hilbert space. So you have to actually check these things separately. And the strong equations of motions actually come from here. You get some equations from here, but most of the, the constraints on the background fields come from this. So this is the, 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 the tricky bit to compute. All right, so here let me just flash the equations which you get. So you get these things which we know well. We get these usual equations for the metric, for the Calvary-Mont field, uh, the dilaton. That is when you have no uh, cosmological constant. If you switch on the cosmological constant, the B mu nu field is gone, but you get a modified equation for the dilaton together with the metric. So this would be, the first line is just what you would have gotten from type two string theory for the massless field. So you get exactly the same equation. So sometimes when we say string theory implies um, gravity, Einstein gravity or extensions theorem is true, but the word line does also. Um, so there's just a little comment here. There's actually another way of saying that this coupling to the dilaton was sort of difficult. Um, and I 
still wouldn't argue that I really understand why it has to couple in this way, but that's what it seems to do. Uh, there is another coupling to the dilaton, which we found also by trial and error, which interestingly um, is also consistent, uh, but it leads to a much stronger equation, actually. It leads to the equation that box uh, dilaton is equal to zero. You know, it's just a decoupled free field. And it, but the vertex operator, which corresponds to this coupling, has appeared before. I think in a, in a sort of obscure paper in the 90s, there was a vertex operator for the uh, ingoing dilaton in the superstring by Kataoka and Sato, which actually corresponds to this coupling. I've not seen this vertex operator appearing again ever since in any of the books. So it'd be interesting to know what happened to it. But in the word line, it is a possible coupling. Okay, so now let me come to the operator state correspondence. So this is again an extension of something that was already observed by this paper by Dai Wong and Siegel in, in 2008, I believe, in, for the n equal two theory. So how does it work? What we do is we take a BLST charge off shell, and, but now we say we write it as Q is equal Q zero plus delta Q, and let us assume that Q zero squares to zero. So we take some background, be this an anti sitter or something, some, some solution of the equation of motion, doesn't need to be Minkowski. So Q zero is close to zero, then of course Q squares to zero implies that Q delta Q equals zero. So then if delta Q on some state, say vacuum, is supposed to be a physical state, if there exists such a vacuum, of course number minus one, since delta Q has course number one, and the cohomology here is a coarse number zero for the point particle, such that Q zero Q twiddle is equal to zero has to have coarse number minus one, then delta Q acting on zero twiddle is automatically a physical state. So that's how operator state correspondence would work. But it so happens there is such a state, and I've indicated it before, it's precisely this diffeomorphism ghost. The diffeomorphism ghost is a state that is in the cohomology a coarse number minus one of, of Q, and we can take that has had precisely all these properties, obviously is in the cohomology as coarse number minus one. So if you act with delta Q on this state, we get a physical state. So we can now take the delta Q, you substitute some variation of the matrix, some variation of the Calvary-Mont field or the dilaton. By the structure of Q, you get two terms. One is proportional to the ghost and one is not proportional to the C ghost, but rather to the gamma ghost. So we can, and they generate acting on this diffeomorphism ground state or ghost, uh, a physical state, which are in this string theory parlance in the, uh, would be in picture zero or picture minus one. So for instance, just to give an example, let's take flat metric and we switch all the fields are off apart from the graviton, we take it the graviton, then this W2, Acting on this diffeomorphism, uh, ghost will just give you the usual graviton vertex operator. And then you can compute, for instance, the three graviton scattering by simply, um, which normally in the word line one would think perhaps we take an initial state, then an interaction with a final state. You just um, take this diffeomorphism ghost and you insert this vertex operator V three times, just like in string theory. So it works in the same way. Okay, that brings me to the so the conclusions, just so it seems like the spinning word line is quite stringy. So it has a lot of information about string theory, but we can quantize it in a manifestly background independent fashion. Um, so there are many interesting things I think one could uh, consider in this context, but could see, let us take the bigger than n equal four word line supersymmetry, then we should get higher spin, we get spin six or five, uh, three or four, so somehow probably should go wrong because uh, we know there are no interacting such theories. So it'd be interesting to explore. Still would be nice to see what is the precise relation of this theory with the ambitwister as a field theory, of course, a theory of background fields. Um, uh, certainly some agreement is there, but it, at this time it looks like the point part is a little bit more um, flexible, not too much, but let's see. Uh, also we could now, compute for this theory, one can easily compute vertex operators in any background, although we don't need to be flat. Perhaps it'd be nice to look at pure, pure spinner versions of this. I'm not sure, maybe has probably already been done. So that would be another nice thing. And the other comment which I have here is that perhaps since all the fields which enter in this generalized geometry or doubled filtery context are already there for the world line. So perhaps we can also double the world line. 
we don't need the hook string filter. So that'd be an interesting question whether one could just double the bird line to see the echoes. Now I'm probably running out of time. There's just one last comment is that about completeness. So we have taken this bird line and equal for bird line, we've coupled it to some background fields, but have we coupled it to all background fields that are possible? So how do we know we consider a complete system? And that turns out to be a rather tricky business. So let me just flash an idea of what one can do is this. You take the algebra, which is generated by all these objects which enter in the world line. So we just say, this is the generator of some associative super, the super algebra with some filtration, which basically corresponds to level in string theory. And then you can do deformation theory. And so can you see what, what are possible deformations of this theory? And that would be a toy model for string filtering and background independent. And for instance, for n equal two, one can indeed, one can see that the at filtration zero, which means sort of uh, lowest level, you have young wheels theory on shell and dilaton off shell. So that's the, the most general deformation. Uh, for n equal four, this is still an open problem. But that's the kind of uh, way, one, way in which one could explore um, completeness or whether we've really spotted all the fields that, that are there. So it's another way of formulating field theory by just starting with an algebra or some sort of Q manifold and then just studying the possible um, solutions of the master equation. And that's probably a good time to stop. Thank you, Ivo, for intriguing talk and uh, keeping the time. So now there is uh, time for questions, and uh, the first questions are by uh, Nathan. Hey, thanks. Uh, that was a nice talk. You, I had a few, well, one comment is you didn't mention the super particle. So the green Schwartz super particle, it's also, I mean, kappa symmetry implies, almost implies all the equations of motion. I think there's a similar subtlety. It doesn't imply the relation of the diloton with the graviton. It sounds like is a similar feature of these spinning world lines. So the, the, the dilaton is free or is it, how does it enter there? So the diloton appears as a super field. So everything is done in course in super space, in 10 dimensional super space. So you have a 10 dimensional super field, which is starts with the diloton. And then you have the 10 dimensional super field, which starts with the metric. Mm -hmm. And the real super gravity, these are of course related because there's a, I mean, there's a single super field that describes all of the 10 dimensional physical state. But in the, in green Schwartz, you don't see this from Kappa symmetry of the particle. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to do the coupling with the world sheet curvature to see a, a relation. Oh, I see. Okay. I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks uh, for that comment actually. So in fact, this is related to some papers by Cyclin, maybe, and, uh, and collaborators a few years ago where they claim Kappa symmetry does not imply completely the equations of motion of supergravity mm -hmm. and for that reason. I mean, even in, in the string theory, people don't know in green Schwartz how to couple to the Frank and Seidler yeah. term. Yeah. So, yeah. But of course, in pure spinners, it's, it's okay. Um, yeah, in pure spinners, the super particle also, I mean, it has the same subtlety with the diloton, but if you do the super string with pure spinners, it all works out okay. Oh, so wonderful. I had is, you say background independence I didn't understand why you claim that the string is not background independent in the same sense. So if I write oh. down the traditional sigma model, yeah. I mean, no. the background independent. Yeah, so what I meant to say is that if I want to, you know, I, I, if, I want to gen, if I want to construct a BRSD charge for a generic background, I, I wouldn't know how to do that because I need a CFT to start constructing a BRSD charge. But suppose I just write down the two-dimensional sigma model and ask that it's conformally invariant. Why is that not? Back on in, just as background independent as you? Oh, I see. So yeah, this is true. So you could certainly consider just as a, um, you could say just you consider the, the family of sigma models and yeah. you say, do you define string field theory by the family of sigma models? Well, not string field theory, but at least the equations of motion. So just to get the, the usual gravity equations of motion, you just ask that the sigma model is conformally invariant. Right. No, this is true. Equation of motion, I think you can get, but could you integrate? I mean, here you see the thing is, okay, I didn't actually display that here, but since you, maybe I can show you here. Um, since we have the BRSD charge, we have, oh, sorry, went too fast. Here, here it is. 
since this omega one is the first derivative of omega with respect to some background, we have it at any point. So we can integrate. So we have, you know, we can integrate the derivative of function to get a function. Of course you have to, it's tricky because you may be path dependent. You have to make sure this thing exists. But so we, we, what we claim is that we know this omega one at any point on the field space, not only at the, on the, on the solutions. Okay, thanks. So uh, now Ezra Gessler has... Uh... Hello. Uh, so um, I saw that you first construct the reduced Hilbert space. I think what, I, if I'm understanding what you're doing, you're breaking your BRS, Q BRST into two pieces and first taking the cohomology with respect to one, which you know has square zero, and then asking whether the, what's left of the second piece has square zero. So I, I'm wondering if, if you considered the whole thing and looked at whether it's square with zero, you might conceivably get extra equations, extra constraints. Yeah, that's a, yeah very good question. Thank you for that question. So what we did in the case of this, uh, the, the minimal gauging, we considered the BRSD charge and added extra ghosts for the SO, for the R symmetry. And then, as you said, we compute the cohomology of the bigger system first. And, and, and ask if it's the same as the relative cohomology. And it, it is the same, but we did not actually check it explicitly, for instance, for this one. Oh, but, okay, thanks. Okay. But for some cases we did, yeah. Right. Okay, and uh, maybe last question by Mohab. Yeah, hi, uh, thanks for a very nice talk. So I have a question which is perhaps related to what uh, Nathan asked. And, uh, so, Am I right to assume that you only looked at 10 dimensions? No dimension is any here. So, so what prevents you from doing this, let's say, in 11 dimensions? And, and, and what would go wrong? I mean, can I, do, do you claim that you would get some version of, uh, of 11 dimensional supergravity by, by, uh, by doing this analysis in 11 dimensions? Yeah, 11 or, or lower also, yeah. This, because, you know, here you don't have this issue, of course, of the central charge, because it's not a conformal field theory. So it, it doesn't force you to uh, say 10 dimensions. Ten dimension, so dimension is three parameter here. Yeah. Yes, but in 11 dimensions, the, field, the background fields are not the same. So, so for example, there is a three-fold field um, that, you, that you have in 11 dimensional supergravity, which you would have to be coupling to and so on. So, so the, the structure is not the same as the one you showed here. The, the one you showed is, is oh, specific, to ten, it's specific to 10 dimensions. Yeah, the yeah, question is whether you can do this analysis in any dimension in a systematic way, including 11, for example. Okay, yeah, th this is a very good point. So that is, relates a little bit to this thing which was making at the end. Did we actually spot the whole set of fields which we can couple? So we have not, you know, we, that is a little bit, it's, it's, it's uh, the thing is, maybe we would have to restrict the Hilbert space differently, for instance, in 11, if we want to get 11 dimensions. You know, say, say if we, th this restriction of the Hilbert space is a little bit arbitrary in some sense that I choose, for instance, um, the U1 charges to be one, for instance, then they get the graviton. If I took the U1 charge to be two, I would get a spin four field probably. And so, so there is some freedom in this reduction. So it's possible that if I chose different reductions, maybe I would get zero solution, no solution, but maybe I would also be able to couple a, a tree form field, but we haven't explored that. Yeah. I mean, for example, it's also interesting in the context of whether there is a cosmological constant. I mean, as you know, there is a whole discussion about, well, I mean, there is a, a kind of theorem that there isn't a, a cosmological, or there isn't a, a gauging of, of, uh, of the supergravity in 11 dimensions, so that there is no version of cosmological constant. So, yeah. so your approach might, perhaps uh, shed some, some light on this. Yeah, no, it's a good point, yeah. But I mean, I can't say anything good about it right now, but that's a good Thank piece. you. Okay, so thank you. I think we are out of time and I don't see any raised hand. So I think uh, we can move to the diversity session. So Nathan, did you say that? Uh, well, so 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 I think when you were saying that we will have this diversity session, my uh, my computer just failed, and I, I haven't heard. What did you say? Well, okay, so let me repeat a little bit. So um, we were supposed to have seven talks today, with uh, Dimitri giving the third talk, but he wrote to us yesterday that he was ill. So we um, we're thinking of what we're going to do during this session. 
And one possibility to have a discussion of the other talks, previous talks. But then when I woke up today, I learned about this strike or a physicist who, um, so I couldn't get my archive listing. So it turns out today there's a special day where people are um, discussing, I think, uh, racism in science. And I thought um, maybe we can, we can use this session to discuss this. And so what we decided to do is that after the meeting finishes today, which is at uh, one o'clock Brazil time or noon in New York, we'll have a, a discussion session about the talks. So Ted Erler will lead that. So for people who want, they can stay just after the meeting finishes. And for those people that go to sleep after the meeting, we'll also meet tomorrow morning. So the idea is we'll go 20 minutes overtime today and we'll start 20 minutes early tomorrow just for people who want to have an informal discussion. So Ted will moderate that session. But right now what we're going to do is use the 30 minute session to just, um, I think, have a general discussion with comments and um, suggestions. So everybody comes from different cultures. So I think everybody has different experiences. So I thought I would say a little bit about the situation in Brazil, maybe the way I see it. And then we can ask for other people to make comments about uh, their situation. So, um, so in Brazil, about 50% of the population is um, either, oh, they don't use the word black, they use because it's mixed. Uh, Brazil is a very mixed population. Um, and there's very few uh, people of darker color that are in science. Um, and the subject is not raised in Brazil certainly not raised to the level it's raised in the US. I think even though Brazil was the last country to abolish slavery, people claim that Brazil is not a racist society. So um, they claim it's economic discrimination and not, not when I say they, I mean, um, not the majority, but at least a large segment of the population think that racism is not the problem in Brazil. Um, so it, people are starting to become aware, but, um, Certainly in science, it's, it's very rarely discussed. So um, sexism in science is discussed frequently in Brazil, um, especially in the last four or five years, partly just because there's a critical mass of, of female scientists who can organize these discussions. So we organized a discussion last year about diversity. And the diversity actually included both race and sexism, but um, 95% of the people participating were women. So obviously the discussion was, was more based on sexism, although racism was also raised. Um, so so it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue which is not yet really discussed in Brazil. And I think it's important. I think um, certainly there is racism in all, I think there is in all sectors of society, not just in science, but also in science. So, so it's something which I think needs to be discussed. So, so that's uh, in general in Brazil. Now, uh, another thing is I'm an organizer of this conference and of course, string field theory is a very small subject, but, um, but even in string field theory, there's a problem. I think that um, there's less women than would be expected even for a, for a scientific subject. Um, so I, I don't, I mean, I'd be interested, I don't know what the cause is. I mean, I think um, obviously the number of women doing research in string field is much smaller than in other fields. Um, but I don't know what the cause is. And maybe it would be interesting oh, to hear from everybody, women also, but um, what their experiences are. So that's more or less what I wanted to say. Um, so I don't think we need a moderator. I think people can just, um, well, they can raise their hand if they want, if lots of people want to speak. But um, so there are two people that are here that I thought maybe could share their experiences. So one is um, Mohab, who um, I know for maybe 10 years. I mean, he's been working on string field theory a long time. And I think he has a unique experience. He came from you know, a country that doesn't have people doing string field theory, at least that I know of. And so I think in some sense, he's he's been by himself, at least in that sense. And also Ivani, who it just happens to be the only female speaker. So it'd be nice to hear their experiences first and then maybe other people can, can say something. So I don't know if Mohab wants to say something first. 
Hi. Yeah. So, sure. So well. Um, so I I grew up in Switzerland. So I, I was born in Egypt, but I grew up in Switzerland, and I went to uh, university in Switzerland, and then I did my PhD in uh, in, in London. So I'm I'm not from a minority in in any sense. I mean, I'm not black, or I'm not uh, I'm not a woman, certainly, and so on. So so uh, I I cannot really speak for minority people, but I, I did have to think about these issues a little bit. And I think one thing which is very important is that there should be um, that there should be role models that that um, that people from let's say underprivileged backgrounds, or women, or black people, or people from religious minorities or cultural minorities, and so on, um, can can look up to. I think that's a, that's a very important thing, and that's that's missing. So maybe. They say in, in mathematics, somebody like uh, uh, Mariam Mezakani is, is certainly some you know a woman which could be who could be very inspiring for for young women who want to get into mathematics or or um, or, or string theory or um, and um, so and I think maybe also specific scholarships for in in this field or. Or actively seeking people, uh, smart students that can enter the, the, this field, and then and then helping them and supporting them is very important. But of course, it depends on the education systems of many countries, and in many countries, they they perhaps underdeveloped or weak, and so on. So, for example, in Egypt, well, you certainly won't find a lot of uh, string field theory. So, so there's a lot of work, and and I guess in 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 Brazil, in most places, is the same. So, I guess you, you would first have to do a lot of work to sort of bring the um, the, the the education system uh, uh, up to up to scratch in in many places. So, it's a very long term um, uh, goal, I think, and um, and also um, I think um, the. The discrimination, the worst discrimination, is is not uh, an open one. It's it's often a hidden one, and so and so, which is why it's very it's very very hard to to fight. I mean, it's it, it will not be it will not be obvious. So let's say when you have scholarships, then I think it's very important to have people on the boards that are sensitive uh, to this issue specifically and and. Uh, and, and look into them. So maybe that's that's um, that's what I, I wanted to say. I could say more, but uh, but maybe I let Yvonne uh, tell us about her perspective. Okay, thanks, Moha. Yvonne, do you want to say a few words? Yeah, I can. I I should also say that I feel as though I'm not very representative of any minority. So my background is I I grew up in Germany and I've been through the education system in Canada. The UK and the US. So certainly in terms of minorities, I'm I'm nowhere nowhere near. So the only thing that I can really speak to is maybe as as a woman in the field. And I think Nathan, you may be a bit too critical because I think the field is small enough that it's probably just reflective of the wider string community or the wider high energy community rather than something that is specific about strength field theory, say. Um, so I think given the size of the field, it's very much within the sort of variation that you find in the wider strength community in terms of number of women in it. Um, yeah, I, I think in terms of actual things, um, I, I can only echo what has been already said that I think what plays a big role are role models. So having people in the field tends either of your own minority or religious orientation or gender tends to tends to help and people tend to cluster as soon as as soon as something like that is possible um, yeah and also that it is rarely outright discrimination that makes a difference i think and more often accumulated small things and hidden hidden things that also accumulate it, accumulate from much earlier. So obviously also string theory as a, as a bigger field uh, ends up sort of receiving or ends up being on the end of the line of a lot of problems that start much earlier in education. Yeah. 
I think that's sort of my, my input here. Thanks, Yvonne. Chris, did you want to say something, Chris Krilova? Um, I can say something. I actually have construction in my next door, so I'm sorry if there's like background noise. But yeah, I wanted to add the LGBTQ community, which wasn't even mentioned. So the fact how unrepresented it is that people even forget that that's like also a thing and something you can be discriminated about. Um, but also like, I mean, I'm technically queer, but born female. So obviously I've had a lot of female discrimination. I'm actually not even in academia. So I'm in industry. This is actually a privilege for me to attend this. This is the first opportunity I've had having any sort of interaction with the string theorists or any string theory talks I've been to. And the reason for that is when I was an undergrad and I was in grad school, I mean, I was actually heavily pushed into experiment just because, I don't know, there's this stigma that maybe string theory is just too hard for females. I mean, obviously that's not something that everybody shares, but when you're unfortunate enough to come across people who think that, there's really very little you can do. So that's just something to add. Okay, thanks. Uh, Jim, you wanted to say something about Karen, what Karen Uhlenbeck has said? I don't know what she has said. I don't know if you want to add. Yes, I had to unmute. <clears throat> just said, Karen, after Miriam, she's probably the next most accomplished uh, female mathematician. In some of her interviews, she's commented directly on, she doesn't intend to be a role model, but it's clear that just by being, she is a role model for the next generation of women mathematicians. And her work is closely related to physics also. That's it. Any other people want to comment? You can just turn on your mic. You don't have to raise your hand. Can I add something to what I said? Yes, of course. Uh, so, so, so about first of all about uh, role models, since other minorities were were uh, were mentioned, I think that's really very important. So, I mean, in in our fields, there are people. Uh, who belong to to uh, minorities and could certainly serve as as role models. For example, uh, Jim Gates is is a very prominent uh, black string theorist, or um, uh, Ashok, or maybe for for Muslims uh, Abdus Salam or Zuel or or, or Kamran Wafa. And I would also like to mention. So I belong to a something which is not a minority, but which is un underrepresented in our field, which is. Um, which are Muslim, so I'm a, I'm a Muslim, and um, and of course it's not a minority on the world stage by far, but it's certainly underrepresented in uh, in, in research and academia everywhere. And I think um, so. For example, in the countries that I've worked um, in, uh, there are structural reasons for that, and uh, and maybe again there one can. Um, one can, on the one hand, use role models like Salam or other people like that um, uh, to inspire people and also try and, um, and specifically um, uh, target, uh, let's say, smart students or, 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 or able students that come from these, these backgrounds and other backgrounds too. So one thing that I have thought about doing at our center is having prizes. Now, I, I don't know if that, um, so prizes reserved for different sect, um, different so either for minorities or underrepresented sectors. Does this create role models, or does it create? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know if this is a good idea. If people have any comments about this, so I so I think I mean prizes should also be, should all, always be on merit. I mean, so so but the, the point is that. Uh, is that there are plenty of people in every community essentially that are smart and 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 um, and could uh, claim such a prize, but it's just that sometimes they don't get the opportunity, they don't get the chance. So I think uh, so. It's not about having it's not having a prize, um, 
you know, based on anything else but merit. But it's it's making sure that these people from underrepresented uh, community have a chance to to compete, so to speak. Just to second your previous comment, that part of this is crucially having a diversity of people on the panels who are making these decisions. Yes, absolutely. I totally agree with that. But how do you get the diversity of people if, if you don't have people? So, I mean, the diversity of people obviously have to be highly qualified people. So we have to have these high, high quality, diversity of high qualified people to be on the panels. And so, I know some women who have come yeah. that as a result. Well, let's say um, if they are representative, then that's good. If, uh, um, I don't, right? No, for women, I think it's less of a problem. For us, it's a problem, for example, to get um, people from, I mean, it's, it's underrepresented, but it's not the minority. I mean, the, the black population in Brazil, I mean, so it would be difficult to, I mean, so, okay, I guess, so your opinions are that the prizes maybe have negative aspects, even so, for example, prizes for women. I, I don't, I mean, I'm curious how people feel about that. Well, especially the women. I mean, how they feel about prizes for women. Yvonne, do you have any opinion on that? Just curious. Ezra has one on chat. So Ezra does, but Ezra doesn't qualify as a woman, I think. So. Oh, oh, right. No. <laughs> um, yeah, I can say I've always felt a bit conflicted about them personally. Um, maybe because uh, you often get it held against you uh, directly in person if you receive such a prize. Because if it's only written out to a special group, then... Um, so it, it has negative aspects. That doesn't mean that it's overall negative by any means. Um, I, I think it probably, like all these things, depends on how you implement it. And, yeah, I think but anybody no else? Thank you. Anybody else have comments? So it's open, so anybody can just turn on the mic. So may I say something? So it's just, um, I came to know about this uh, foundation called uh, um, Supernova Foundation, which helps uh, minorities, uh, people from Africa, people from Latin America and South America. And uh, they try to uh, help people from even at the level of schools. Uh, it's just because I came to know because my wife is a physicist and she's part of this uh, foundation and she helps many, uh, especially very, very young women. I mean, maybe someone at the level of 12 years, 13 years. So this foundation tries to motivate the kids. So my wife spends roughly, I don't know, half an hour or one hour in the entire month. And she guides, um, especially women students like that. And there are many such people. So if uh, something we want to make a change at the grassroots level, this might be an idea. I'm not saying that this is the way one should do it, but this could be a way to groom very young people, young women, especially from very underprivileged part of the world and trying to at least guide them, tell them this is what you can do, what you can achieve. And these are the role models, whether they're men or women or whatever sections they belong to. So this is something which one can perhaps do it, I guess. Anybody else want to just turn on their microphone and say something? I can only support what just was said, but my experience with outreach in, in high schools is, you know, you have to send people to high schools and ideally not old men like me, but some young women, because that really runs. If, you, if they see the students in high school, see young men, women being successful somewhere, then that will attract them. So I think that would be very a promising approach. So maybe, maybe I can mention uh as well. So, Go ahead. Know. Oh, yeah, you're right. So I can mention, so ICTP, I think, is doing a great job in these directions. So for example, I know uh, Kate Shaw, who's a, a, a British physicist who's, uh, who's uh, in charge of the uh, um, of a program that they have at ICTP in, uh, in, in Italy. Um, where they they visit 
they organize physics schools in, in remote countries or countries that have particular issues. So I know that they've been to Afghanistan, they've been, they've been to Northern Iraq and so on. And I think this is, this is usually inspiring um, uh, to the people who are there and, and, and plays a great role in, in, in raising the, uh, the, the profile of science and research in, 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 in these areas. And I guess one can do things like that in Brazil and, and really in many, many places. And I think that's, that's, uh, that's a, great, uh, it's a great initiative. Anybody else want to say something? Um, yes, I would like to say something. So uh, some of you may already know, but uh, with Shubroni, we try to set up a website on string field theory uh, with some additional tools. And I was thinking that, I mean, one of the purpose of such a website would be to, um, to help also a bit in this direction because something I have the impression is that if you know where you can find information on the field, you have more chance to join from different places. So for example, yeah, um, one inspiration was the website from uh, Tooft on uh, how to become a theoretical physicist, which I know helped many people to, from India or other countries to know how you can move towards, uh, I mean, theoretical physics. So I think that it's something that is lacking for a uh, string factory, some like, platform where there is a very clear list of uh, resources and also people working on the field which you can contact and uh, write to. And another thing we wanted to set up is a kind of a chat where people can just discuss, discuss at any time. And so I was thinking that this could also help because if you're working alone uh, in an institute where you just have your supervisor doing string factory and other students of postdoc, um, this is something that could help if you, I mean, you can just reach out very easily other people and also the virtual aspect can help in the sense that, uh, um, I mean, if you're shy, it can be difficult to just go to speak with people, but if you can just write uh, and ask for help, which can be either like, uh, I mean, on a phys physics aspect or just more general or, uh, looking for support. Uh, so I was thinking that this could help. So I think uh, uh, Shubrone might speak more, I mean, present more the website at the end uh, of the conference. Um, and in any case, we were planning to send emails uh, in a few days. But um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I just wanted to introduce quickly this idea, which uh, clearly will not solve. And it's also a question of trying to bootstrap, but it can be also a way to people to find more easily uh, who they can ask or discuss with if they need help. Uh, so, yes. Very good. Anybody else want to say something? So, so can I speak just? Yes. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, so the outreach pro idea that was just proposed, I think that is a really great idea because uh, personally I'm from India. I'm from Calcutta and I'm an undergraduate student and I, I really found that the students near me and uh, most of the professors, I'm not talking about them, they were already very interested, but the students, their population is far bigger than the uh, professors, right? So I found that there is a very, uh, like, uh, not only among the women students, but among the men students and among everyone, I found there is a, like, there is a lack of approach. Like, uh, they just, uh, not all of them, not like most of them just go for a high, like, uh, like uh, attending seminars, like attending higher objects, uh, higher topics, like, this, like, suppose there is a string field theory, like, uh, they, they, most of them just don't, uh, they just, consider, they just like to consider it over, like, about that part which is being uh, taught in the schools or that part which is being taught in the colleges. And that not always cons uh, concentrates on the entire vast amount, right? Like uh, uh, syllabus in school, like those are basics. I know that they, they, they are very important, but at the same time, when a person is studying physics, like they should, they should at least have some uh, uh, interest on topics like string theories, on topics like uh, higher, uh, higher research objects. So, so I, uh, that part, I just don't found that uh, most of them, there are a few of them that they are very interested on this. But if the outreach process is being widely produced, if the outreach is being increased, then I guess there, there will be more persons who will be getting interested in this. Okay, um, thanks. Obviously, I think it will be a very great thing in here. So 
any last words before we stop for the coffee break? Anybody else want to say anything quickly? Okay, very good. So thanks very much for the discussion. So as I already mentioned, at the end of the meeting today, we'll have a, a discussion about the talks. So um, it will start immediately after the meeting finishes and tomorrow morning, 20 minutes before the meeting starts. Okay, very good. So we'll have a coffee break and we'll come back at 10.45 in Brazil, 9.45 in New York, and I guess 3.45 in Paris. Okay, so see you soon. Thanks.
Anupam? Yeah. Yeah, maybe you can uh, put your share screen now. So we are ready to start uh, the, the, the second session today uh, by Anupam Mazundar, who will tell us about resolution of singularities in infinite derivative gravity. Thanks. Thank you very much, Martin. Can you hear me all? Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you well. Okay. Uh, so uh, also thanks to Nathan and all the organizing committee to uh, give me a chance to present my work. And uh, so today I will talk about infinite derivative gravity and certain aspects of that uh, in resolving singularities. Um, so the aim of my talk uh, is very much uh, uh, slightly more towards the application side. And the question which I'm interested in asking is that how do I mimic some string theory features in field theory, essentially? So it's a non-local gravity, okay? And uh, this is the work which actually I began with uh, Warren and uh, Tirthabir Biswas way back in 2005. And gradually some of the progress have been made in this direction. And this is what I'm going to share with you very briefly. So, um, you know very well that um, uh, locality is one of the feature in field theory. And perhaps this is also the cause for all the troubles in some sense, uh, especially the one over R singularity, which is present in Newton's gravity, general relativity. And as a consequence, you get the black hole singularity and also part of it gets reflected in forming even the horizon, the concept of horizon and all sorts of trouble, which is associated trouble comes with the black hole horizon. In the context of cosmology, we know that um, um, uh, the, the, if you have, I mean, the Hawking and Penrose theorem, which suggests very well that if you have normal energy conditions, all your geodesics will become past incomplete. Now, inflation is a mechanism which can um, you know, explain the large scale structures of the universe, but it is not suitable to explain the singularity problem. So the question which one can ask is that, okay, if you cannot solve this problem uh, uh, directly, can is there any way we can resolve this problem? And one of the things which comes in essentially from the lesson we have learned from string theory is that, um, or in other uh, formulations of quantum gravity, that maybe some non-local features might help. And by definition, strings, brains, these are essentially non-local objects. So what aspects of string theory then can enter into uh, explaining some of the time-dependent problems? So essentially what I'm interested in especially the time dependent time uh, dependent problems in physics. Now, just a mere simple observation. We know very well, just uh, if you got some finite number of derivatives, uh, it does have a point support. Some finite derivatives acting on Dirac Delta will always give you back the Dirac Delta. But if you got a non-local operator acting on Dirac Delta, it doesn't give you, it smears out the singular um, um, uh, structure and gives you some Gaussian profile. So again, this is just a hint perhaps, which tells you that maybe some certain form of non-locality might help you. Of course, this is a very specific kind. It's a static situation, but the problem arises in a time-dependent case, which is much more severe. So uh, how do I really approach this from string theory or string field theory side? So, so the way I'm, uh, I'm kind of like uh, perceiving this problem as a non-local theory is an approximation of a string theory. Um, and why perhaps uh, I will tell you that why do we take this kind of uh, uh, alternative approach or maybe slightly, maybe the pure string theorists will say the slightly inferior approach, which will become clear to us. It's, it has certain advantages. And of course it has some disadvantages too. Now, um, if you take a string theory and our, uh, Ivo's talk was quite, uh, quite nice and he already uh, touched some of these topics which I'm going to talk now is that um, if you take a particle limit, you essentially end up with a world line. And if you want to complete the world line, the UV completion of the world line, that will give you some form of non-local field theory. And that we have seen it, uh, appearing from the periodic string theory or certain aspect of string field theory also comes into uh, the same uh, bigger class that there are, there are some non-locality appears in your, in your action or in your interactions and things like that. So what are the advantages? Now, one of the advantages is that, um, because as I said in the very beginning, whenever you want to deal with the singularity problems, they are related uh, to, with the time dependent. And in a string theory, we know that uh, dealing with the time dependent problem becomes very much nightmare. 
uh, as soon as uh, I, I bring in time, time dependence, uh, it, it, many things, uh, they are not in the world control. And so this approach, although it's an approximate approach, it helps us to understand some time dependent problems, such as how do you form a bag, uh, Big Bang singularity? How can you, uh, you know, resolve the singularity? And how, how do you form even a black hole kind of singularity? And how can you resolve it even? And having said so, there are many, many people in the community which have contributed, many people who are present in uh, today's conference, today's workshop. So it's, it's really a collective learning which we have learned from many papers throughout um, this adventure. So the first question which you can, we can ask is that what really softened the behavior, UV behavior in string theory? And how can I mimic that uh, you know, behavior in a field theory? So that's the kind of very simple question one can ask. Now, uh, as we know that uh, when we talk about uh, one loop two point uh, 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 diagrams in string theory, now there are two contributions which you obtain. One is the due to partition function and the other is the world sheet green function. And both of them actually help us in understanding or understanding the certain UV aspects of uh, my uh, geometry, my, uh, my am uh, amplitude. Now, when it comes to partition function, uh, they are very useful to um, uh, ameliorate the UV problem in a low energy, low momentum regime. So this depends on the kinematics, of course. So in the low um, external, when the external momentum is small, then the partition function does help us to ameliorate some of the UV behavior in the particle theory. And, uh, 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 and similarly, in the ex uh, extreme limit, when, uh, when the external momentum or the uh, kinematics essentially, uh, is uh, much larger than your string scale, the world sheet part or the green function part of the world sheet becomes uh, very important. It, it helps you to ameliorate some of the UV properties. And that is quite evident in papers uh, from Gross and Mendes. And subsequently, many people have uh, investigated this kind of problem. Now, um, so essentially, um, looking at the, um, um, and the, uh, the, the action which, you have which I have written down, of course, it's a particle limit. Of course, in the, in, the, in the stringy picture, there are many, many contributions. I have just captured only the relevant part, which is the uh, you know, world sheet part of the uh, uh, action. And, of course, and then there's a partition function, which I have denoted here by Z. So in the large tau 2 limit, so tau is my modular, um, 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 modular uh, uh, form. So in the large tau 2 limit, and when you take the, when you project this uh, amplitude in the world line um, integral, you get the particle amplitude essentially. And since you know that this, uh, the amplitude, the string amplitude has a modular invariance built in. So essentially you also have a modular invariant uh, uh, form of the amplitude in the particle world, uh, uh, in a particle world line uh, limit. So this is something which has recently been investigated by a few of our colleagues and just uh, and so Steve Abel and his uh, collaborators, Dondi, had looked into this uh, world line approach. Now the question is that once you get this kind of amplitude in the, in the particle limit, um, the question you can ask is that what kind of propagator do you really generate? And uh, this is something very interesting. And uh, this you can even look into in a simple example like a scalar field theory. And you can do it for any higher spin, spin half, spin two, and a higher spin theory as well. And what you find is that in the... Schwinger's way of thinking of Schwinger parameterization, the proper time uh, in the Schwinger uh, proper time in the field theory case, T of T will be simply T, but now T of T can be, uh, can have some interesting form. And that form depends on this uh, modular uh, function T, small t. So if it's T is T plus one, you get a for, um, propagator in the scalar field theory case, which is very similar to your um, kind of like, which appears in piadic strings, or string field theory as well, uh, e to the power minus some momentum square. And uh, the one which uh, preserves the modular invariance also gets some, uh, has a propagator, but in UV behaves very similar to the case of uh, that of the T plus one, essentially the exponential damping of your propagator. And all these propagator in the infrared becomes like your uh, standard one over P square or one over K square in the massless uh, case. And the advantage of uh, these uh, propagator in the scalar field theory, in the simple case, is that uh, they regulate the, uh, the you know, short distance behavior. So in the moment, in the spatial space, the, the two point correlation becomes finite and governed by some scale. Now this scale, we can interpret that to be my string scale. 
So given this kind of propagator, now one can ask the question that how could I mimic that in, in the case of gravity? And this was precisely the question we actually asked where, um, some time ago when we were working with Warren in this topic. Now, uh, when it comes to gravity, so especially today, I will be talking about um, um, essentially spin two, but now you can do it for any higher spin theory. Now, um, in the case of gravity, if you ask a very naive question, uh, if I want to go beyond my, uh, uh, you know, Einstein-Hilbert term, even at the quadratic level, the, you, you come up with infinite contributions, even at the, just at the field theory level, nothing fancy here. And uh, so you get infinite contributions. And these contributions appear in terms of your form factors, like F1, F2, F3. Gravity essentially is a massless theory, so only a derivative interaction. So it becomes like a pion form factor, similar to the pion, you get a gravitational form factor. But majority of these terms, which you see here, are redundant because you impose the Bianchi identity and the conservation laws. And at the end of the day, you can show that whether it's in uh, Minkowski space time or Dissiter or anti Dissiter space time, you can get a, you, know, you can sum summarize this entire quadratic curvature action, which is, I have to say, it's a torsion free. You can impose torsion. And it's also parity invariant. You can also break parity and write down similar kind of action. Um, in four dimensions, as well as in any arbitrary D dimensions. And uh, they are summarized by essentially three form factors, which includes the Ricci scalar, Ricci tensor, and the Riemann part, which you can write it in terms of while as well. And uh, these form factors have the, uh, now the question is, the challenge becomes, how do you determine these form factors? Now, of course, it uh, then becomes like a background dependent approach. So in a given background, you can fix these form factors and something I will touch upon that. But before that, so if you take this action, which I have mentioned here, you can write down the full equations of motion. And you see that since this action is, first of all, is highly nonlinear, but also it becomes non-local because it has all the infinite derivatives sitting there. And as a consequence, the equations of classical equations of motion becomes extremely, extremely hard. There are double summations everywhere. There are, um, um, and, the, and these double summations actually preserves this non-local information in some sense. So in spite of uh, you know, going into this particle limit or a world line limit, the problem remains there. I mean, life becomes, uh, it's not become so easy, even in this field theory picture. So, um, so just, to, just to give you some glimpse of it. So essentially in the Minkowski space time, so these form factors, F1, F2, F3, they are constrained. So we can show that uh, just from the unitarity that the uh, two F1 plus F2 plus two F3 is zero. And the way you try to preserve this unitality is that you look into the propagator of the entire action. And what you find is that uh, the propagator can be, uh, can be written very simply in terms of one function, which is A of box or A of K square in the momentum space. And if you demand that there should not be any pole, uh, so then this A of K has to be some uh, E to the power, some uh, entire function. An entire function we know, which are very useful. It doesn't have any pole in any complex plane. So it, has, it doesn't include any new dynamical degrees of freedom. And similar kind of property has been investigated in spring field theory by Ashok and uh, his uh, student. Um, and they have looked into it much more detail here. I have just presented the, the tree level, but they have looked into it at all loop levels as well. At higher loops as well, uh, uh, you can continue from Euclidean space to Minkowski space with similar kind of propagator. So uh, now you can ask the question, okay, you have this kind of action. It is, uh, it's equations of motions are very ugly, but in spite of that, can you do something? Can you, uh, can you solve some problem or not? And when it comes to solutions, so we, we, uh, we looked into uh, certain classes of the solution and um, some are uh, linear solutions, some are exact solutions. So I'm going to briefly explain a little bit about these solutions, which are, uh, what, are um, uh, what corresponds to uh, cosmology and in the case of black holes. So first, let me try and play, and play with the cosmological solutions, time-dependent solutions, and it is quite interesting. So suppose you take a very small subclass of this action with um, R, with F of R, box R, and the cosmological constant. What you can show is that you can solve this uh, equation exactly, and this is very inspiring because the part of the solution which we have learned essentially from uh, quite old paper uh, by uh, Zuibach and. I showed when they were trying to solve the closed string, uh, sorry, op open string tachyon. So what we realized that uh, in spite of having this non-locality, this non-locality is very, in, in some sense, very mild. So when you talk about the free theory, 
free theory doesn't uh, have this non-local interaction. The non-locality appears when you talk about the interaction terms. And in free theory, the quadratic level, you can solve this equation with this kind of recursive relationship that box R is proportional to R, where R is the Ricci scalar, and then box N is also proportional to the Ricci scalar. So with this technique, you can solve the entire nonlinear, highly non-local equations of motion. And what you found that, uh, what we found with um, uh, Siegel at the time, that in Dissiter, if you have cosmological constant positive, then you get a, a solution, cosmological solution, which is actually uh, non-singular in a Friedman Robertson Walker type of cosmology. So you, you get a bouncing solution, where, which could be um, time, which is time symmetric. And you can actually now ask the question whether this is such a solution is, uh, stable, is stable or not. So essentially you can go one step further and ask whether uh, there is any ghost present or not. And in order to have no ghost, no instability, that, uh, that essentially puts constraint on this form factor. And one particular form factor, which is very interesting, which I have mentioned here, uh, and this is something which I have uh, worked out with uh, my colleagues uh, uh, present in the University of Groningen, Sravan and um, my student uh, Shubham, and this, with this form factor, what you can show that gravity essentially becomes uh, uh, negligible, essentially it doesn't play any role at the, uh, at the singular point. So in spite of the fact that you start with the gravity, you have a, a, you know, gravitational degrees of freedom, but at the bounce point, what happens is that you only have scalar degree of freedom, which is left over. And this, this scalar, scalar degree of freedom, essentially offshell scalar degree of freedom is stable. And if you go to antidecitor space-time, what you find is that in, in antidecitor space-time, you get a cyclic kind of behavior. You, you, you not only have one bounce, you have multiple bounces uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this framework. And uh, again, the uh, fact that there is no ghost, that gives you some constraint on this form factor. Now, you can ask something similar kind of question. For, so this, uh, the, the, uh, the solution which I've shown you here, this is time dependent, but let's move on to slightly uh, um, no, uh, static kind of solution. And in this case, you can ask the question, what happens if you have a point like uh, you know, a source? And suppose you have got a Dirac delta source, what is the potential you would generate for this kind of source? And we know the propagator, and uh, in, in, in four dimensions especially, you can uh, get rid of the wild piece or the conformal piece, essentially Riemann term, because of the gauss bonnet identity. And as a consequence, the action simplifies a lot, in spite, and still you have the non-locality, but in, in spite of that, you can simplify. And you can ask this question that what is the uh, gravitational potential due to just a point uh, system, point particle? And what you find is that, and you can again play with the propagator, you can take the propagator which preserves your um, uh, modular invariance and which, uh, which does not preserve the modular invariance. So here the blue curve, if you see the blue curve has the modular invariance and the, the rest of the ones are not, doesn't preserve the modular invariance. And as a comparison, I've shown you also for the, just the uh, pure Einstein theory where you have, you, you have a singularity, which is denoted here by the red curve essentially. So what you find is that uh, in, in all these cases where you, you try to modify the propagator in the UV, which you, where you can soften the UV behavior, the, uh, the Newtonian potential becomes softer. Essentially, you can get rid of the singularity, point-like singularity. So you get, you get essentially something like one over R times your error function. And error function, again, goes as linearly in R when, uh, at short distances. So essentially, you get a gravitational potential, which is essentially constant in the UV. And what you can show is that you don't have the uh, uh, curvature singularity in this kind of system, and the solution approaches to a conformal limit, essentially. And that's something very interesting. Part of this, although this is a linear solution because you have played with a point-like system, but what you can show uh, in the subsequent slide, I will show that uh, it's some of its behavior persists even if you go for full non-linear, full non-local uh, non theory as well. So one of the advantage for such a, uh, such a solution is that you get a, uh, you know, a very simple, a very simple small black hole perhaps, but doesn't have a singularity, doesn't have a horizon. And it might pave some, uh, you know, uh, have some consequences for uh, even the last stages of a black hole evaporation or, uh, you know, in terms of information loss paradox or something sort of, uh, you know, that. So let's move on with the nonlinear part. So as I said that uh, you can solve the full nonlinear equation and what you can show 
is that uh, the, the part where this non-locality plays the most important role. If the non-locality terms uh, con uh, contribution dominates in the far in the UV, even in the full non-linear theory, you can show that there exists a solution and this solution is actually conformally flat. It has a very remarkable symmetry uh, uh, with the Dissiter space-time. Now, instead of, in the case of Dissiter, you have not 2 over MSR, but you have 2 over some MST. The T will appear in the case of Dissiter. So what happens is that you have an extreme UV limit. The solution you generate is purely conformal, which is not very surprising because, after all, it's a quadratic curvature gravity. And box, essentially, all these infinite derivatives makes the gravity weaker and weaker in the UV. It softens the UV behavior. And as a consequence, you get a conformal solution. Of course, this uh, conformal solution is broken once I add the infinite, uh, sorry, once I add the Einstein gravity term, and that will immediately lead to the, uh, uh, you know, one over R behavior in the infrared. So, so far as uh, so much about the classical aspects. So one, uh, the, another thing which you can think about, how this system behaves, uh, the, exactly this action, the one which I've shown you, this action, how it behaves when I talk about certain quantum behavior. Now, uh, this, so this is the question which we wanted to ask. Now, you have the action. Now, uh, if you, you want to understand how this theory behaves uh, at, say, you know, when you scatter graviton, say, for instance, or in this theory, uh, and you talk about the ultraviolet, uh, very high energy graviton, graviton scattering. So uh, the pure gravity theory becomes very, very hard to uh, understand. So what, what you can do is to simplify the problem. You, you can try to mimic this in terms of a scalar degree of freedom, phi, and you preserve all the symmetries of, the, uh, of gravity, essentially, uh, that uh, you have a, a conformal symmetry as well as your shift symmetry. Both are preserved in this case. And um, so essentially, you try to mimic the gravitational feature in a scalar field theory. So you have got a scalar, a free scalar field theory, which uh, with uh, your um, very similar to your um, string field theory kind of propagator, e to the power minus box, and your interaction, which is cubic in term. And since there is no mass term in gravity, so all the interactions are derivative interaction. And then you ask the question, what happens if I take, say, n scalar graviton, if I call it a scalar because it preserves uh, certain features of gravity, in this, in, uh, uh, if you take n scalars, and you collide them. You try to take a UV limit, a UV limit uh, for this uh, uh, action, uh, for, the, uh, for the interaction, uh, for the scattering, and see what kind of amplitude you generate. Now, what we found is that if you have this N scalars and you, you look into the amplitude in the UV limit, what you find that this very interesting feature appears is that uh, there is a, effectively you, get a, you generate a new scale in the problem. So essentially, UV IR kind of connection builds up here with uh, with n scalars essentially. So the scale which was MS, MS was uh, your fundamental scale you started with, uh, gets shifted with number of uh, a number of scalars essentially. So you generate an effective um, scale because you you see that your amplitude is suppressed, p square over n. Um, uh, p square n times m, uh, uh, ms, where ms is your fundamental scale. And so you generate a new scale m effective, which, is, which goes as ms divided by square root of n. So as n becomes larger and larger, if you put in more and more uh, scalars and try to interact them, your effective scale keeps growing. And that's something this property is essentially persists even with the zero external momentum. So similarly, perhaps if I have to do this calculation with the pure gravity, maybe what will happen perhaps, as of course, the part of speculation, the graviton calculation I have not done so far, maybe this N graviton system would behave like a condensate. Perhaps there will be some new uh, feature will appear in, the, in, in this context. Now, in, one can now take this uh, viewpoint and um, one can construct a, a, a massive system, which uh, here in the massive system, where you have n scalars, uh, n scalar, which are behaving like a very much like a coherent state of n scalar gravitons. And you can construct a self gravitating system very similar to a black hole, but now it's no longer a black hole. It doesn't have a singularity and it doesn't also have a horizon. So I can imagine that I have an astrophysical black hole sitting, which is made up of this n scalars, uh, n scalars interacting non locally. So as a consequence, what happens is that, because as I said, that uh, since your scale, effective scale of non-locality increases, it's no longer uh, you know, the, uh, situated at the fundamental scale, but it's, it's, it spreads all the way to the infrared. 
and that uh, and if that radius is larger than my Schwarzschild radius, and if the, such a system is self-gravitating, then such a system perhaps can even mimic black hole. And nowadays we are living in a very exciting time because of the LIGO and Virgo and all these new uh, detectors coming up. Maybe one day we can perhaps probe this kind of question, uh, whether you know the black holes which we see in the sky, or do they really have a horizon? Or they are behaving something like similar system, like uh, you know some kind of non-local objects, and perhaps those were, you know who know the, the subject very well, they would say, hey, something similar happens also in the first ball, Samir Mahu's first ball scenario as well. So very similar feature appears even in this context. So in order to uh, just to just to give you some numbers, if you want to take the solar mass black hole, solar mass object, if you want to mimic this, you would require something like huge, humongous number of n scalars, something like 10 to 80, 10 to 90, or you know depending on the uh, mass of the system, it can be even larger. So some of these things perhaps you can entertain and you can definitely, these are interesting objects because these objects don't have a horizon. So essentially you don't face it, the information loss paradox in, uh, in these kind of problems. And then you can ask the question that um, how much entropy does such a system can, can, can preserve? Or you can ask the question, suppose I take a chalk and I throw into the system, uh, when does this chalk comes out? And uh, it's exactly like doing the similar calculation like what Hawking did, so Hawking evaporation. So even though the system, they don't have a horizon, they can still evaporate, they can leak. Some of the states can leak into uh, outside the system in terms uh, which would similar to your Hawking radiation. And what I found here, uh, amazingly, that uh, the, the time scale for these objects to evaporate is even longer than that of the black hole. So it seems that they are even more stable than a normal uh, Einstein's black hole. Einstein gravity is black hole. And uh, so this is some, um, th something very interesting. So these systems can even store your information for sufficiently long time, but it can, uh, of course, uh, will give you back all the information. It doesn't have a horizon. So uh, in all the problem with the stretched horizon and the pure particle creation near the horizon, they don't appear. So in this respect, it doesn't have this uh, problem of entanglement, essentially, the, the, the problem which gives rise to Hawking, uh, Hawking's information loss paradox. So having said so, you can ask, uh, so you can write down the metric for this such a non-local system. And what you find is that this amazingly, the size of this object comes very close to your uh, Bukdal limit. Uh, you might have known about this Bukdal star, which is supported by your pure, uh, you know, constant energy density. Um, but in the Bukdal star, essentially what happens is the pressure builds up and pressure blows up. But in this kind of system, with, an, an, with a non-local interaction, your pressure remains finite, your number, uh, your energy density remains finite, there's no singularity you form, and uh, the advantage is that since these objects are bigger than your short child radius, um, it has some interesting feature, and perhaps you can now ask the question um, to our colleagues from uh, LIGO and Virgo that to what extent can I probe this kind of system, what are the quasi-normal modes for such a system, and uh, you know, things like what, is there any echoes, uh, and you know, things like that you can now ask, and perhaps solve the problems. Okay, so uh, my time is running out. So um, um, I just want to highlight some of the other solutions. You can also show that uh, the, this non-local feature, non-local uh, interaction essentially, can also smear out the ring singularity. Like a, a, instead of having a curved black hole, you can get a non-singular rotating uh, metric as well. And uh, since um, I believe that my time has really come to uh, close to an end, let me uh, leave with this um, a brief summary. So I believe that this non-local feature is very interesting. It doesn't, it is an alternate approach. It is, it is not really as pure as string theory or string field theory, but it helps us to understand certain aspects, especially the time dependent problems when it comes to resolving the singularity problem, whether it's a cosmological singularity or even um, the black hole singularity kind of problems. And uh, recently we looked into and uh, the, the nut charge, uh, essentially, the, um, uh, and how to resolve this, uh, uh, you know, singularities in, in such uh, systems as well. And th there have been other uh, development. Prolog, for instance, had looked into how uh, the dynamical aspects, even so you take two uh, wave fronts, uh, uh, the plane wave wave fronts, and you hit them, you, coll you collide them and see whether you form singularities or not. And uh, the result is, again, there's somehow non-locality uh, helps you in resolving singularities, even the formation as well, uh, aspects as well. So uh, with this, let me thank all of you for your kind attention, and uh, I'm happy to have your questions. Thanks, Martin.
Thank you. So now there is time for questions. So I can't see any raised hand. But you can maybe just turn on your mic and uh, ask a question. Yeah, I don't, I don't see any, any question. So can I have a question? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, sir. So the you know, non-local stars can mimic black hole without event horizon, that portion that I just mentioned over. So could you please just elaborate on this, like uh, without an event horizon, like uh, as far as we know about the black holes, that is the event horizon is the one that boundaries the, uh, boundaries the system. So without an event horizon, how can that thing just be stable? Like, uh, like will the black hole still be, still be stable? Like uh, how can it be possible? Can you just please elaborate on that? Okay, thanks uh, for your question. So yes, you can think about it like even there are uh, examples like boson stars, gravis stars, Fuzz balls. These are a, a self, uh, you know, uh, self-gravitating system, um, and such a system can be made stable dynamically. Of course, no one has looked into how do you, uh, you know, really form this kind of system. I mean, we don't know how to even form um, exactly the fuzz ball kind of system. Or here in this case, I do not know how exactly, uh, you know, the when n particles comes in and forms, uh, uh, you know, system. We don't know the entire dynamics of it, of course. But uh, essentially, these are self-gravitating system. You can think about a self-gravitating system. It's compact system, uh, but not as compact as your black hole. Okay. So <clears throat> the part is that uh, theoretically, there is something which is termed as a white hole, which is just the opposite of the black hole, which is uh, marked by something named as an anti-horizon. And the anti-horizon is, uh, as far as I read, the anti-horizon is absolutely unstable. That's why we can't just form a black hole. I, that's why we can form a white hole or einstein rosen bridge. Why is that not possible? So this the, does it relate that, uh, is this the reason why the anti-horizons are not stable? Well, um, here we don't form a horizon at all. So it's different from a white hole solution. Okay, okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so thank you, Anupam. Anupam. Thank so in uh, view of the time, maybe we should uh, move uh, to the next talk by Lawrence Schlechter. He will tell us about the bosonic tachyon, uh, bosonic string tachyon potentials from an equal one point of view. Thanks. Um, first, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the possibility to speak here today. So I'm going to speak about an old topic, uh, bosonic tachyons, but from a new point of view and looking at them with new methods. And these methods are superstring field theory. I will start with a short introduction about the idea and how we can use these new methods to gain new insights in these old problems. Uh, then I will go on and, and explain how to embed these bosonic theories into the superstring theory, how we use these CFTs to construct a string field theory around this embedding. Then I will explain shortly how this works up to cubic and massless order. And in the end, I will comment on the L infinity structure and problems coming at quartic order. So tachyons are by now an old story. The open tachyon conversation by now is well understood. We have analytic solutions and they are known to describe the decay of deep brains. Similarly, localized closed tachyons are well understood. They describe the decay of compact dimensions, or if they are localized at an orbifold, the decay of this orbifold to flat space. But what about the bulk tachyon? There was a lot of work on the potential for the bulk tachyon in the 90s and early 2000s by many people in this conference here. And the result is quite irritating. So we have at cubic order a stable minimum, which seems to disappear at quartic order, but reappears at quintic order. There were many papers about this, and they peaked in one paper by Nicholas Müller and Young in 2006, where they went to really high level, and everything seems to converge to a tachyon minimum around 0.05, whatever this value means. So if we look at this a bit graphically, at cubic order, we have a really nice minimum, which is still far away from the value it will obtain in the con uh, conversion in the end. 
at court order, this plot I took out of a paper by Biopolsky, we see we get a clear runaway behavior even if you integrate out all the massless fields. So this is a runaway behavior. In the end, this doesn't lead to many insights because we seem to have a minimum in the end, but we cannot really interpret it. And if we add the sixtic order, it will be run away again and so on. So what can we do about it? In a really nice paper in the year 1993, Berkowitz and Buffer showed that the bosonic string can be embedded into the superstring. This embedding adds additional degrees of freedom, which exactly cancel each other out at the bosonic point, leaving us with a bosonic string theory. But what happens if you take this conformal field theory as a basic for a string field theory and deform it away from this point? then these degrees of freedoms will no longer cancel each other out exactly, and we could find new phenomena. So if we assume that all of string field theory is uh, globally background independent, we would have the following picture. This is a sketch of the theory space of a non-perturbative formulation of string field theory where we would have a bosonic string field theory, which is embedded into an n equal one supersymmetric theory, which itself, again, is embedded into n equal two theory. I marked some of the known theories with dots, and the violet arrows are known tachyon condensations. For example, the open bosonic tachyon is known to describe the decay of the deep brain, and what remains is a purely closed theory. Hellerman showed in 2008 that the type zero superstring tachyon also leads back to the bosonic tachyon. Moreover, it's known that the n equal two superstring tachyon also leads to the closed bosonic string theory. If you take a normal 10 dimensional superstring and make it non critical, so looking at it from a 12 dimensional theory, for example, this uh, tachyons will always lead back to the type 2b theories. Also, if we look at subcritical strings, for example, an eight-dimensional type 2b theory, there will be towers of decays leading in the end to a bubble of nothing. So all of these tachyon conversations are well understood, mainly not with string field theory methods, but more with CFT methods. But what about the bulk tachyon of a closed bosonic string? This was mainly ignored in the literature. So we have these string field theory results, which find a non-perturbative minimum inside the theory space of bosonic string field theory. But what would, could be happening is that actually this tachyon conversations does not lead to a theory within the bosonic string field theories, but to a theory outside of it. For example, it could lead to the type 2a theory or to any other to this point unknown theory. In this case, we would at some point hit the boundary of the theory space of string field theory and would see a minimum, which is actually not a minimum, but only a saddle point, which appears to us as a minimum because we were only looking at the degrees of freedom of the bosonic string field theory. So what I was setting out is to analyze this bosonic theory again by embedding it into a super string field theory and see what we get. The methods I will be applying are just numerical. I'm using level truncation and the erler knopka sachs formulation of the superstring. So what will we need to do? First, we need uh, to embed the bosonic string in the superstring, which was already done by Waffer and Nathan. When we use superstring field theory, as I said, the EKS formalism. When we apply numerical methods, mainly developed by Rastelli and Zwiebach, so this is are the conservation laws and the numerical methods for Müller to evaluate the bosonic vertex, uh, vertices, uh, then using this, we can calculate a really high dimensional potential in field space, and we can solve the resulting equation of motion searching for vacua. Uh, all of this, as I'm only interested in minima, will be done for zero momentum vertex operators. So how does this embedding work? Uh, the basic observation was that there is a hidden n equal two supersymmetry in the bosonic string theory, which requires the choice of a current, so it breaks the Lorentz symmetry. But what they observed was that if one adds an additional spin-shifted fermionic ghost system, which I will denote by B prime, Z prime, which was not their convention, but I will need the sub-indices for mode expansion later on, 
this system has a conformal dimension of three half and minus one half, and this is added to the meta system. So these have the correct spin statistic. They have uh, half integer conformal dimensions and are fermions. And the resulting theory is then this. So we are working in a superstring. So we have the usual PC system and the beta gamma system. We have our 26 dimensions of the bosonic string and this added spin shifted system. The, I just for completeness have added here the energy momentum tensor. This is just an topological enhancement terms which will not play a crucial role. Given this embedding, it's actually exactly equivalent to the bosonic string at this CFT level, because the beta gamma system and the BPRMC system have the same conformal dimensions, but opposite statistics, so they exactly cancel out. And in their paper in 93, they already showed it's also holding in the amplitudes. This theory was also used by Hellerman and Svensson to show that it's the exact endpoint of the type zero tachyon condensation by using field redefinitions from the type zero string. This is not the endpoint of these embeddings. One can show that this is possible to extend to n equal two by adding even more fields. So of course, in the n equal two superstring, we have two beta gamma systems. We have our R symmetry ghosts. So now we add two B prime, C prime systems and an additional system, which is a linear dilaton theory with background charge one to cancel out everything. And even this is not the end point because this n equal two string has a hidden n equal four symmetry. So one can in principle continue this, but I will not follow this line. So when we have now this CFT, how do we construct a string field theory around this background? First, we need to construct the level truncated Hilbert space, which will give us our vertex operators. Then we need to write down a string field theory potential as a sum of string functions. This is already solved by now. We need B insertions, a PCO prescription, and so on. But this is all given in terms of the L infinity formulation of superstring field theory. Then we need to evaluate the string functions. Uh, this is done by conservation laws using ghost number conservations to eliminate a lot of the terms appearing without any computations. And we, of course, need the conformal maps to the end functions field. I will be here quite old school and just use the minimal area metrics uh, to define the bosonic L brackets. And in the end, we need to solve the resulting equation of motions. This will simply be done numerically. So how do we construct the Hilbert space? I want to be as general as possible, so I will only impose the necessary conditions, which are level truncations. I will be working in Siegel gauge. Uh, the picture numbers is, are fixed to minus one in the neuve schwarz sector and minus three half and minus one half in the Ramon sector. I will not put any ghost number constraints. Um, of course, in the end, one could always uh, fix ghost number two to get rid of the additional degrees of freedom because I'm not including the torus contribution. One could have some stomach ache that this could lead to problems, but I checked this does not influence the results. Uh, the beta gamma system is treated like usual, so it's feminized to give an ETAC size system in the five field. And with all of these conventions, the lowest light state in the NS sector is the usual tachyon, which has conformal dimension minus two and this rather large vertex operator. And as I'm said, I'm not adding any momentum in the game. Moreover, now there are 16 additional tachyons with conformal dimension minus one. So these arise through the additional fields, for example, acting with a B prime uh, mode on uh, removing the C prime field raises the uh, conformal dimension by one. So we get additional tachyons and a huge amount of 121 massless fields. Just to compare this, I will show if we use the same rules on the bosonic string fields, we get 10 fields up to the massless level. As I said, I'm not setting, uh, fixing the ghost number. So if I would demand ghost number to be equal to two, this would eliminate all these additional fields and only the ghost dilaton, the graviton, and the tachyon would remain. Um, if we calculate the potential, so the, uh, to cubic order and massless level, this is the potential with the string field. Again, this is not the usual form. So I have additional fields in the game this is this term here, I could just remove it by demanding ghost number two. And if you look at the dilaton terms, it's not in the twist symmetric basis, but this is just a field redefinition. If I introduce the usual combinations for the dilaton and the pure gauge dilaton, this exactly becomes the usual. 
this is just to make clear, I'm not using the conventional basis, but for computation, it's actually easier to just use monomials in the operators and not linear combinations of them. This was the reason why I did it like that. So, but we are interested now in the formulation of the super string field theory, not bosonic. So what we will need is an uh, a expression in terms of the L infinity brackets. The uh, cubic one can simply be represented as a free punctured sphere. The conformal uh, transformations to the free punctured sphere are known. I, there are in total nine different terms with permutations here. I just mean different uh, insertions of the picture changing operators. We have two and three vertices, so we have in total nine possibilities to insert them. I will also use the EKS formalism. This means the picture changing operators are inserted at the vertices and not at separate points. So this means we are only using the zero modes of the picture changing operator. So now I will go step by step through the different orders, starting with the quadratic one. This, of course, is the easiest ones. Uh, the L0 gives us just the conformal dimension of the field. Uh, these are evaluated using uh, the usual BPC in a product. Uh, we have to choose an overall normalization. This two here is chosen to be in accordance with the usual literature and to fix the kinetic term of the tachyon to just be minus t square. And if we plug in everything, we get in total five kinetic terms. If we now diagonalize the mass matrix of these fields, we see that you don't have actually 16 additional tachyons, but only four eight massless fields and four massive fields at, uh, level minus, uh, at level one. The cubic terms are uh, in the same level of difficulty. So we have the conformal transformations. I chose the usual square root three convention. Um, we can eliminate all creation operators using the usual conservation laws, which are obtained by introducing an additional uh, form, which has dimension one minus the operator. By deforming the uh, contours to infinity, one can show that this has to vanish. If one expands now the operators and this phi into modes, one gets relations between the operators, which can be used to eliminate all of them, except the C1 and C prime one half mode. This can be used to bring all possible amplitudes down to one basic amplitude which now can be rewritten into open amplitudes. So this is the basic closed amplitude. And if one is careful about counting the signs from the commutations relations, one sees that there's no additional sign from this reordering. This is different to the usual bosonic case because there one has an odd number of operators which commutes with what one gets a minus sign. This two here is just the conventional which was chosen for the overlap. And all of these open string amplitudes are now a simple U1 affine symmetry amplitude, which is completely fixed by the symmetry, so one can simply evaluate them. With this method, we can then evaluate all cubic potentials with the following result. I'm only showing the tachyonic term because the massless term of 138 fields is just too long. So one reproduced the usual uh, free tachyon coupling, which is a good sign that everything is right from numerics. And one gets a whole bunch of new terms. And as I said before, most of these terms are tachyonic. So the uh, potential is much more complicated than in the bosonic case. Now we can just take uh, first derivatives of this potential with respect to the fields and solve the resulting equations. And what one finds is four different solutions. The so first solution is just the zero tachyon solution. So this is the bosonic vacuum. When we find the usual non-perturbative vacuum at roughly the same values, but now we see some of the masses are still negative. So these are all additional tachyons. So we are indeed no longer in a minima, but only at a settled point. There are two more solutions, but if one looks at the mass values, none of these look anything like a type two super string. So we have many more than only one tachyon. In some cases, the tachyons have even lower mass than what we started with. So the interpretation of these additional solutions is quite hard. If we plot the potential, one also sees what is going on. So this line here is the usual one dimensional tachyon potential, where we have our usual uh, zero tachyon vacuum and the non-perturbative vacuum. 
But now we see we additional solutions just run away to infinity. Here is indeed a small settle point. It's too far zoomed out to see this, but this and this point are the other two solutions. So it's really hard to interpret these solutions, but this could just be an effect of us working at the massless level and cubic order. So what happens if one go, wants to go to higher order? Uh, of course, everything becomes much, much more complicated because not of the techniques, because all the computational methods needed for this are in principle alone since years, but the amount of terms to compute explodes. And of course, now the conformal maps are only numerically, but this was uh, solved by Nicholas Müller uh, around 2009, I think. So the EKS solutions to the inf L infinity relations is actually given in a recursive way. So what we need is L223. So this means P and Q equal to two and N equal to one in this formula. And one immediately sees we have here a triple sum. And a triple sum means a lot of terms. In the end, if one expands all of these terms and using the cyclic symmetries, this gives of the order of 200 terms to evaluate for a single vertex. The nice thing is everything in terms of picture changing insertions is already solved here because it's expressed in terms of a bosonic bracket, so we can use the old work of Müller. Um, but there's one problem. This does not only include terms of a form L3 of the string fields, but also um, an L2 of an, another uh, two bracket. So if you would think an open string, this is a double star product. And in this new theory, these turn out to be extremely difficult to evaluate. In principle, one has two methods to evalu evaluate these double brackets numerically. First, one can use conservation laws and a reflective state to move all of the oscillators to the third Hilbert space and then insert this again into the L2 bracket and do the same thing again. This in principle works, but as one has to shuffle around the commutators a lot and to keep track of signs, etc., this works but becomes extremely slow and actually my code was not enough to even ha handle the massless level. Um, there's also an explicit formula for these star products using surface states, but this leads to insertions which are not at the origin and this causes problems with e to the minus, thanks, uh, e to the minus phi terms because these are, uh, cannot be expanded into modes easily and if they are not inserted in the origin, the usual formulas no longer hold. So, but there's an extreme simplification happening for a certain ghost structure. If we demand the, let's say, usual ghost structure, that is ghost number two for the C ghosts, ghost number two for the additional C prime ghosts and picture minus one, really drastic simplification happen. To see this, let's look at the heterotic string. I copied this from the appendix of the original EKS paper about the NS and S super string. Uh, the heterotic string is just chosen that this uh, formula met, uh, fits on one slide, but the argument stays the same. If you look at this, we have the L3 bracket terms, which are easy to evaluate, and these additional L2 of L2s. But the structure of all of these additional terms is the same. We have two xi zero insertion and one pixel changing operator insertion. Now, if you look at the explicit form of a pixel changing operator in this theory, uh, we see immediately that all of these terms vanish if we have this ghost structure. The reason for this is the following. We need only one xi zero insertion for a non-vanishing amplitude. So the pixel changing operator needs to kill one of the xi's. Only these two terms here contain an eta. This is for the usual string field theory perfectly engineered because the additional b also cancels out the additional c, so every amplitude is non-vanishing. But now we have this additional c prime system. This has an anomaly of two, but the string field has ghost number one, so we get four, so we need to kill two of these. So we have two, pick, uh, we, we don't get any possibility to, if we have got these terms to kill out these fields, because we need the B prime for coming from this picture changing operator. So in total, these terms will always vanish as long as these terms here have pick a ghost number uh, two or one, depending if you count both C and C bar. So if we would truncate our string field theory to only fields including this structure, we get all of the bosonic fields plus an additional time direction. Uh, this 
is perhaps a bit strongly said because we get not an additional time. This phi field has fixed momentum. So we would get modes in this additional time direction, but not momentum because this is fixed by the constraint for the picture number. But the additional tachyons, so where the real new physics would be happening, do not have a structure. So these are really the hard terms to compute. And of course, beyond the master's level, also a lot of other stuff becomes difficult, like we get more B insertions, more combinations, the number of terms just explodes, and one can't not really compute anything anymore. So what can we do? Of course, if we get better computational methods, and we heard over the last three days a lot about localization methods or using other vertices in terms of uh, hyperbolic metrics, this could help. Um, we could include torus contributions. I, in 2018, there was a nice paper by Zwieper and Hedrick doing first numerical computations of torus uh, minimal area metrics. One could extend it to the n equal 2 case, which if the resulting and endpoint of the tachyon condensation lies in the n equal 2 supermoduli space could be necessary, but this adds even more fields. So all of this, I don't think will help us in the near future, but in long term could lead to new insights. But what is really interesting could be an application to open string field theory, where everything is much easier to compute. And the structure is really fascinatingly easy. If I just go back to the L infinity structure, in the open string, the L3 bracket, the bosonic, can be taken to be the Witten star. So this is just not there because we only have an L2. So only these terms here survive. But for the usual terms, as I said, these are just zero. So one immediately recovers that the open string is just cubic, even if we are working in the super string. But these terms obviously come into play if you look at these additional tachyons. So there's a lot of structure which one can look at. And I think this can lead to further insights of how these picture changing operations, or in the n equal 2 case, instanton changing operations, go hand in hand to construct the different string field theories and how the bosonic theories are embedded into the superstring. That's it from my side. Thank you for your attention and I'm welcoming any questions. Okay, thank you for this very clear and uh, very interesting talk. Uh, now I invite questions from the participants. I don't see any raised hand, but just turn on your mic and ask. May I, I have, have a question? question? This is Ted. Okay, Ted, go ahead, you first. Okay, um, so there are a number of things. Uh, one is, okay, you, you just said that, so have you tried to compute the tachyon potential for the open string? Uh, okay, let me try to understand. So you could compute the, the tachyon potential on a non-BPSD brain in super string field theory using this EKS, not EKS, uh, <laughs> this Munich construction. Um, so, uh, but I don't think that has been done. Uh, but uh, you were uh, you were claiming that uh, you have some results uh, computing with this theory in the case that it's on that it embeds the bosonic theory. Is that the and there the tachyon potential is cubic? Yes. Okay. And of course, only the traditional tachyon. So it's really reproducing the bosonic string field theory result if one truncates only to the bosonic fields. Yes. So, um, um, so what, what is, um, so you, you embed uh, the, uh, the closed super, the, the closed bosonic string into a type two uh, kind of action uh, with, so you have n equals one comma one, right? Yes. So uh, wouldn't it be easier to embed it in a heterotic action type action where you only have any like n equals one comma zero or, um, I, I'm, I'm not sure I 
understand motivation, like uh, uh, what exactly? Uh, the, the idea was to see if these additional degrees of freedom destabilize the minimum one finds if one only uses the bosonic theory. So I wanted to add as many degrees of freedom as possible. And the most advanced uh, super string field theory we have at hand at the moment is the type 2. Obviously, I would actually like to go to N2,2, but I have never seen anyone formulate a string field theory around this theories. Yes. Okay. And uh, what what is your... Okay, there's this uh, Yang's Weebach uh, vacuum of the cl of the closed bosonic string field theory. Um, so I'm not sure what is the upshot or what is your opinion on the uh, on whether that vacuum exists or does not exist or how are you uh, how do you hope to improve on it or um, so the thing is I actually think that this vacuum is just at the boundary of the bosonic string field theory and that's not a true vacuum if you go to super string field theory and it's that it's an artifact of using bosonic theory. And okay. of course, I'm at the moment having only massless results at the cubic order because of problems you were so nice to point me towards the quartic computation. Uh -huh. uh, but at the cubic order, this vacuum disappears. One still finds it numerically, but it's just a settled point. But is that is that meaningful physically? You know whether it's a saddle point or not. I mean, this, I mean the uh, the physical fluctuations around the vacuum are not given by uh, you know the uh, the mass matrix computed from the the derivatives of the potential on the stationary point. So um, it may look like a saddle point in the potential, but actually. Uh, be stable, so to speak. Um, it, it, it definitely could still be stable, but I'm just saying that you can go even lower in the potential and that there could be other minima which are a real minimum of this potential. Okay. And, but of course, I would need to look at the cohomology of the BRST operator around the sphere, which I can't because I just have an indirect way to approach this minimum. Yes. But there, okay. So the, your claim is that there are other minima in the in these uh, embedded theories that have lower energy, and that this uh, Young's fever minimum could, in principle, be unstable. I I cannot prove this because, as you said, I'm just having a potential, but it's yes. not the minimum of this potential at least. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Nathan, go ahead. It's your question. Part of my question was already asked by Ted, but I guess there's a deeper question, which is, so the two theories are supposed to be equivalent at the world sheet level, but you claim that they might be inequivalent in the string field theory? Yes. You because they're in, in the very embedding. Ethan, are you saying something? I'm sorry, you didn't hear me. So the two Theories, the bosonic theory and the embedding in the superstring are supposed to be equivalent at the conformal field at the, at the world sheet level. I mean, yes. the coma is all the same. Are you claiming that the string field theory is somehow inequivalent? Yes. Because Why? If you, deform, you, you deform away from the CFT when you give the tachyons a ref. So no. I would. Sorry, but these are all auxiliary fields or unphysical fields. So why should they modify any physical measurement? Because we are off shell. We are not in the theory itself. So I would expect them to be different. Okay. Okay, let me think about it. Thanks. Okay, so this, this was some uh, very interesting discussion, which we can uh, certainly continue at the end uh, after the last talk today. So now let's move uh, to the coffee break and uh, let's reconvene at, uh, at uh, 12 noon uh, Sao Paulo time, so in like nine minutes.
So Nathan, just let me know when I should start. Okay, Martin, I think we'll introduce you. Okay. So let's wait uh, still one minute. Mm So uh, let's start the last session today with uh, Kevin Costello, who will tell us about Green Schwartz string and the four D Chern Simons. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Martin. So um, I I am talking about uh, joint work with um, Bogdan Stefanski. Although one of those projects where I feel like he did all the hard work. Um, so what we were what we're studying is a new a new realization of the Green Schwartz string for ADS5 times S5, in which um, the integral the fact that it's integrable is, is, is manifest. So, so this is in terms of 40 transimus theory. So let me explain a little bit about what that is. So we can think of 40 transimus theory. It's it's some kind of quantum field theory machine, which starts from a four-dimensional system and produces two-dimensional integral systems. So depending on what you do in four dimensions, they could be discrete integral systems like integral lattice models, or they could be integrable field theories. But this was something I developed uh, by myself, but also in joint work with Witten and Yamazaki. So the part of the best most relevant for today is a paper I wrote with Masahito Yamazaki last fall. So here's the, the, the basic picture. Um, we consider um, basic input is a Riemann surface with the holomorphic one form alpha. And four dimensional transimus theory is a field theory on my Riemann surface times just plain R2. I'm going to give coordinate dz bar on the Riemann surface sigma and w w bar on R2. And generally speaking, the theory is it's holomorphic on the sigma direction, but topological in the R2 direction. So the fundamental field is, well, as a, a turn diamond type theory, the fundamental field is a gauge field. But there's a slightly funny feature. It has a z bar. W, the W bar component, but it does not have a Z component, where Z is the coordinate on the surface sigma. So it is a, a three component gauge field. And the Lagrangian is simply the Chern-Simons three form for A, and I wedge it with this, my chosen holomorphic one form. So generally speaking, this produces a, a four-dimensional theory, which is topological on uh, or two and holomorphic on sigma. Um, we'll see in a moment that the topological nature of or on this or two plane is broken at special points on the surface sigma. So for the purposes of today, the most important feature of this is that, is that if I study the effect of two-dimensional theory on or two, this is automatically integrable. So the fact that it's integrable just follows immediately from the origin in terms of in four dimensions. So I'll give you some examples in a minute. Um, but I have to explain a subtlety. Everything depends on this one form alpha and this one form can have some spectrum of poles and zeros. So away from the poles and zeros, it is as I described, but at the poles and zeros, we have to be careful and think a little bit about the, what boundary conditions I'm going to have in my fields. 
And I can get different answers depending on what boundary conditions I choose. So I'll come back to that in, in a minute in, in more detail. Um, so in this picture, the integral field theory I get in OR2, the spectral curve is this curve sigma. The lax operator is, is very simple. It's just the expectation value of the gauge field. I take my four-dimensional gauge field, evaluate it at some point z in sigma, and I, I average, and I get some operator in my two-dimensional two effective theory, and that's the lax operator. And if you study the 4D Trent Simons equations, they are, they include the equations, ah, sorry. Um, they include the equations include the equation that FWW bar equals zero. So they, in particular, imply the lax equation. So in this way, by starting with this 40 setup, we engineer very many two-dimensional integral fields. And most of them are new, because sigma could have arbitrary genus. Sigma is, is a genus bigger than one. The resulting integral field theory seems to be very complicated, and it's quite difficult to put it into explicit form. But today, we're going to fo focus on things of genus zero. So let's see how we engineer the simplest, not the simplest, familiar uh, integral field theory, which is the ADF5 times S5 sigma ball. In that case, so I, we need the ingredients. We need a Riemann surface. My Riemann surface, in that case, is, is going to be CP1. My one form, I take it to have zeros at the origin and at infinity and then four second order poles. So it, uh, it looks like this. And you notice that the one form is invariant under multiplying z by a fourth root of the unity. Uh, and my group is going to be PSU2 from the two slash four. If we look at this, we realize we have to impose some boundary conditions where the one form has a pole and where it has a zero. Because if I study my Lagrangian, alpha where's the Trin Simons form, we get this an expression like this. And I want this expression to have no poles. I want this expression to be regular. I also don't want, don't want it to have too many zeros, otherwise, otherwise my equations in motion will be this. So to ensure that this expression has no poles and no poles and zeros, we say, well, uh, where the one form has a pole. My gauge field has a zero. My gauge field has a first order zero. The first order zero will appear here and here, giving me a second order zero, canceling, canceling the second order pole down there. And similarly, where my one form has a third order zero, coming from this CQ part, I'm going to ask that either AW or AW bar has a third order pole to cancel that. At zero, a w is a third order pole, and at infinity, a w bar is a third order pole. Okay, any questions? All right. Maybe I should wait till the end. This is a pretty short talk. So, as I mentioned, there's a z mod four action which rotates the coordinate z, and I also want to make it act on psc two comma two slash four, and if you if you do a little calculation, you find that the resulting model is the usual ADS5 and S5 sigma. So what, am I, what do I mean by a little calculation? We have our four-dimensional gauge theory. You, you choose some gauge in which you can express the four-dimensional fields in terms of the two-dimensional field sigma. And then you calculate the Lagrangian in that gauge just by kind of churning through some quantum integrals. And you find the standard form for the ADS5 times S5 model. Now, it's really not a surprise that this is what we find because if we back up a little bit, you'll notice that the poles and zeros of A. This is the last, this is also the last matrix behavior. Right. 
So the last matrix for the ADS5 and S5 supermodel, it has the, you know, the, the plus component of my cone coordinates has a pole at zero and the minus component is a pole at infinity and it has certain zeros. So that's consistent with the statement that the lax matrix is the expectation value of the four dimensional gauge plot. Um, now, as I said, very many models can be realized this way. So there's a nice paper of Elder, uh, Lucro, Magro, and Pichedo, I believe Ben was in the audience. And they showed how if you vary the boundary conditions, you can produce certain well studied deformations of the signal. I think they studied the lambda deformation. Um, well, strictly speaking, they studied the, the deformation of the principal Carroll model, but I'm, I'm sure their techniques will work in this case too. Now, of course, this model is related to the pure spinner. So, so what my talk is going to be about is the green Schwartz spin. So how are we going to engineer that? And um, the answer is very simple. And in fact, we can almost we can almost guess the answer by studying the lax matrix for the green Schwartz string and comparing it to that of the pure spinner string and, and realizing that the lax matrix has a slightly different spectrum of folds and zeros. So if we do this, what we find is that we need to vary the boundary conditions. So at z equals zero, before one of my components of the gauge field had a third order pole, now I'm going to say it has a second order pole and the other component, the W bar component, has, first order, has a first order pole. So again, this will be reflected in the behavior of the lax matrix. And at infinity, we, we do the same thing, but we, we, we reverse which, which component is which kind of pole. Now, if you use a gauge and churn through the various cal the little calculation to compute the effect of action, you find that this is the, the MT signal model for ADS5 and S5, which is really the green Schwartz string. So that's very simple, but this doesn't really give us the green Schwartz string, because the green Schwartz string has a lot of other things going on. I need to think about the world sheet metric and also about kappa symmetry. So the real content of the work we did was to um, uh, explain how the world sheet metric and kappa symmetry can be realized in this context. So how do we do this? So the, the four-dimensional twin science theory is, is almost topological, almost but not quite. It's topological in the WW bar plane, except at the point where Z and Z bar have poles, or where Z, except at the points where the one form has poles, because at these points, I've broken the symmetry between AW and AW bar. So, if we want to couple to a world sheet metric, um, it's only going to really affect what happens at these points. So to do this, we introduce a, a field called a Beltrami differential, which gives us a variation of the complex structure, the WW bar plane. And similarly, there's a complex conjugate field, which varies the, the anti-holomorphic structure. And this field beta and beta bar, they can both depend on z, but they're going to decouple away from the locus z equals zero and z equals infinity. It will only be relevant there. If you want to think in terms of a more standard world sheet metric, these are more or less two of the components of the metric, and the other third, the third component has been removed by a value scale. And then once, once I have this, piece, this um, field, which gives us deformations of the complex structure, I can gauge the diffeomorphisms in the WW bar. There's a natural coupling, of course, between beta and beta bar, and this is uh, my gauge field, 
it's a gauge invariant coupling, and the coupling comes simply by, you know, we replace every occurrence of the D bar operator. It's sent to like D bar plus in the W direction, plus beta and so on. So it's very, it's very easy to draw the coupling. Away from z equals zero, z equals infinity, the fields beta and beta bar decouple by a field redefinition. That's not simply because the theory is topological away from those points. Now, if you, cal if you calculate what the coupling looks like at z equals zero and infinity, I expand it in, in terms of, um, <clears throat> I expand my fields aw and aw bar in terms of powers of z, it looks like base beta, aw2, aw2, base beta, aw bar 2, aw bar 2. So we, we notice that the Z-mod 4 symmetry says aw bar 2 is an element of the, the degree 2 part of PSU 2, 2, 2 slash 4. So we conclude that by varying this Beltrami differential, we find exactly the Virasoro constraint appearing in the um, <clears throat> appearing in the in the Green Schwartz spring on ADS five transistor. So you know we have to work a little bit to to, to try to keep this at the quantum level, and we haven't really done that fully. But it's possible to make Beta bar, beta bar dynamical, we have to introduce another field. And ultimately, that will give rise to the B and C ghosts. Here's a cartoon picture. If this indicates a two sphere, then what we're finding is that the degrees of freedom of the string are spread out over the two sphere. And in the bulk here, in this bulk here is the TFT in the W W bar plane. And then there's honest physical degrees of freedom living at z equals zero and z equals infinity. And those physical degrees of freedom, which include BC ghosts and the complex conjugates are all are glued together by this TFT. Okay. So let me explain a little bit about you know, the other important feature of the Green Schwartz ring, which is kappa symmetry. So I've always well, I don't think I've really heard of kappa symmetry until Bach told me about it, but it seems very weird if you look at it. Anyway, it all seemed weird to me to me. <clears throat> Try to read in the, ori the original expressions, but this turns out to have a very, very simple explanation in this picture. So in four dimensions, we have a gauge field. It's like a perfectly ordinary gauge field, or reasonably ordinary gauge field, with three components. So this has ordinary gauge symmetry. The variation is given by a standard gauge transformation, except that I dropped the DZ component. And when we did all these calculations with the, to derive the signal model, we had to specify the boundary conditions, and that included specifying the boundary conditions for the gauge field. And the boundary conditions were that this gauge field chi was regular at zero and infinity. And at the roots of unity, the width vanished. So kappa symmetry is obtained very simply by just modifying this constraint about the gauge field. We allow the gauge field to have an extra pole. So instead of asking that it's regular at z equals zero and infinity, we allow it to have a first order pole at zero, like this. And I say there's a superscript three because 
the way the ZMOD4 action works is that this must transform in that piece of PSV2 from the 2 slash 4. And I don't want it to be an arbitrary first order pole. The nature of the pole must be um, that the residue of the pole must be expressed in terms of the gauge field and certain free parameters. We have this expression here. So the residue of the pole is built from the free parameter, kappa, and the polar part of the gauge field. And similarly, it's equal to the So kappa is you know, the local parameter of kappa symmetry. This is the fermionic symmetry. Um, and you can check that once we impose the Virasora constraints, allowing my, um, my gauge transformations to have an extra pole preserves the action. If we would like to work off shell, we could also allow the Beltrami differential field data to vary the kappa. There's some, there's some expression. Okay. So, I might end a little bit early. So, just in summary, what we found is uh, this, this four-dimensional transcendence picture gives a new presentation of the green fourth string, where integrability is just none. And features of its kappa symmetry and the virtual constraints appear in a natural way. Now, we know that four dimensional transcendence theory is a quantum theory. But the work we've done so far mostly focuses on the theory at the quantum level away from the locus where the one form has zeros. So, away from the place where the string degrees of freedom are. So, what we'd like to, to do in the future is to understand what happens. At, at one zero, whether the quantum theory makes sense also with the equal zero and the equal difference. So I'm, I'm kind of hopeful this might, might give in a nice way of understanding the Green Schwartz string at the quantum level because we've broken up the problem of quantizing the Green Schwartz string into a chiral and anti chiral problem separately, then get glued together by a TFT if we understand well. Okay, so I think I would like to stop there. Okay, thank you. So we have actually quite a lot of time for uh, questions. So I have a question and nobody raises their hand. Yeah, no one seemed to be raising their hand. Can, can I ask a question, Martin? Go ahead, Nathan. So um, I have a few questions. So the the Green Schwartz string is only conform. I mean, the ADS five times S five is only conformally invariant in ten dimensions. Is there something special about your model when the theory is conformally invariant, or does it just describe integrability and doesn't say anything about conformal invariance? Well, uh, what I expect to happen is that there will be a one loop anomaly coupling to the Beltrami differential field, which selects 10 dimensions. So, um, so we already know there's a paper by um, William and Williams uh, called the Holomorphic Bosonic String, where they, they study you know, coupling a chiral theory to a Beltrami differential field, and there is a one loop anomaly which selects in that case 26 dimensions. So I would expect something similar to happen. And can you also say something about quantum integrability? Is there something that breaks down about the integrable theory at the quantum level? No, I think, I think we can understand some things about quantum integrability. I mean, the, the, I mean, this particular model is one we don't understand as well as something simpler, like the principal Carroll model. Um, okay. But in, in the models where we you know, have a good feeling for four-dimensional transcendence theory at the quantum level, including these defects, then, then we know that um, the lax matrix gets replaced by uh, um, you know, the path ordered exponential of the lax matrix 
makes sense with the quantum level and perturbation theory, and we can understand it, you know, various things about it. So, so there's nothing special in 10 dimensions about quantum integrability, is that correct? I don't think so. I think 10 dimensionals only appears because of the Beltrami differential. And the Lax matrix, like for instance, the T operator will be, you know, the Beltrami differential only lives at these points and equals zero and infinity, and the T operator lives everywhere else. So they don't, I don't see how they really touch each other. I, I don't know if Andrei Mikhailov is online, but so he studied quantum integrability and I thought there was something special about the groups, PSU224, that you have to have some vanishing, I don't remember what vanishes for PSU224. There is, yeah, there is something special about the group. So the, the dual coxeter number of PSU224 slash 4 vanishes, that is the trace of x squared in the ideal representation. Um, so this is important because um, Suppose I wanted to make my, my flat space or two into a curved surface. Well, there's an anomaly to doing that proportional to the dual coxeter number. So I, there, I can only have a chance of having a string if I have that algebraic constraint. Okay. And the other question is, can you do a free string using this? Or is there something that have to be? No, I think we can. I think, I think all, all you do is you take this scaling limit of of the algebra PSU two committee slash four, which becomes, um, you know, the, the ten dimensional Poincare group plus you know, the ten dimensional, like the super Poincare group, and I think it should work. Okay, but there's no simpler way to get to, to just flat ten dimensions. Uh, I don't. I mean, for the bosonic string, there might be something simpler you can do by, but for the, for the green fourth string, I don't think so. Okay. Thanks. Any other question? Can I ask something? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, so this uh, holomorphic Chern Simons model that you have uh, worked out in sigma times R two, can you also put it on the total spaces of some more interesting line bundle holomorphic line bundles over these Riemann surfaces? Or is there an anomaly? Let's see. So in in, in this particular case for PFT two comma two slash four, um. You can do things like a product of two Riemann surfaces with every frequency. And if you wanted to have some kind of fibration structure, you need like for some four, you know, some four manifold fiber in some way. Yeah. You need a little bit more geometric structure on that four manifold. Some, it's some, um, like a, I haven't really studied this, but you need you need like a two-dimensional foliation, where in the transverse direction is a holomorphic structure. So I, I <clears throat> possibly. Well, I was actually thinking of null infinity, but in general, you can have any manifold, uh, any such holomorphic line bundle. Uh, but for example, if you think of the null infinity of R4, then you have this vibration structure of uh, an O1 comma one bundle over a uh, Riemann sphere. And I was wondering if you can just put uh, a holomorphic churn Simons on that instead of, uh, usually you model uh, amplitudes using twisters, right? But uh, twisters and amber twisters are usually uh, the cotangent bundles of null infinity. I was wondering if you can make models directly on this cone-like uh, vibration of a Riemann surface. But I was just wanted to ask if you have done it on any curved example, anything. Uh, the only examples I've really studied are product manifolds. So I don't. Sure. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Can you show me? No, oh, somewhat. Mm. Who is asking? Uh, it's Andrew Mikhailov. Hi. Uh, so, as an integrable system, it has uh, the um, sigma model has n cell of Poisson brackets. 
Can you um, can you see this pencil of Poisson brackets? Uh, the Hamiltonian structure. Can you see it mm, from John Simon's point of view? I don't think I know what the answer of Poisson brackets are, so I don't. The Hamiltonian structure. There is a um, the sum of two Poisson brackets is again a Poisson bracket. Oh. I have no idea. I, uh, yeah. Another question related to uh, um, the usual relation between WZW and uh, three dimensional chain silence. Yeah, I mean, the conception of that is very closely related to that, absolutely. I mean, the usual relation is the two dimensional chain silence theory are on an interval with Jewish language. And recognitions on each end. Yes. Right, the WDW model, and then if I lift this to four dimensions by replacing the interval by a sphere, we ah. um, find something similar. I see. Thank you. Okay. Are there more questions? Hi. Can I ask uh, one question? So it's Pedro here. Kevin, okay, I mean, do you think is there something that you could imagine that could be easier to compute in your formulation, like some particular observables that could be easier to study in this formulation, or it's mostly to prove that the model is integrable and to make the integrability more manifest? No, that, that that's that's a fair question. I, I would. I mean, there's two things I'm hopeful for. So one is like, there might, if there are special observables which localize particular places in four dimensions, and then you then you can understand them better. Um, so that, that might be one, one way to understand things better. So another is uh, symmetric quantities. Yeah, I mean, the, the other thing I'm kind of optimistic, maybe not, not optimistic, I, but I'd like to investigate is, is was whether you know, the green Schwartz string has, is, is difficult to quantize except on a cylinder, and perhaps this might kind of just give us some insight into that model. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. Okay. More questions? Albert, can you uh, speak louder or closer to the microphone? Can you repeat your question? Do I understand correctly that uh, Green Schwartz string uh, was obtained on R2? Probably you can obtain it on every surface. Uh, is it possible to uh, do this? I'm, I'm really sorry, Albert. I had a bit of difficulty understanding. Did you, did you hear better, Martin? Oh, I didn't hear. But uh, maybe can you move closer to the microphone, Albert? Or maybe can you type your question in the chat window? Doesn't matter. I will. Uh, I will ask. This. I will just ask this question separately. I will ask Kevin separately. This okay. okay. So are we waiting for the question, or oh, Albert disconnected? So maybe Albert, you can write your question and maybe Kevin can uh, answer your question uh, in the discussion session after the last talk. So uh, let's move to the last talk by Eduardo Casali, who will tell us about uh, higher genus monodromy relations and color kinematics. Hi, let me just share. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. 
Good. Okay, so thanks for inviting me. Uh, and so this, as I see, it's, it's a bit of a, a preview for more of tomorrow stocks, which is an amplitude. So this is a bit of more of an amplitude stock. Uh, but it does contain some new, some interesting things. Well, at least I find interesting things on the theory limit uh, on, this, on the string, but in a very particular, in particular, the curly split uh, string when you add by hand a few uh, loop momenta to the string theory, right? So this builds on work that appeared last year and earlier uh, last, last month with uh, Sebastian and Piotr on that. And also the technical details are going to be there. But if there's anything that needs to be further explained, please ask and I'll, I, I can explain further. So uh, one of the things that I'm interested among other things, uh, it's on this color kinematics and a double copy, which in their relations on amplitudes, so in field theory amplitudes, uh, but they can be uh, understood, we know that they can be understood uh, three level from the string theory. So what they are is that if I take a field theory, three, uh, this actually doesn't have to be three level, so it can be a higher loop, but it takes some young mills amplitude, you can we write it in terms of three valent graphs, where these are some set of propagators. Uh, C gammas are some set of uh, color factors, which is just traces of, of the, the color matrices. And then there's some numerators which are purely kinematical. So I'm just separating all the color in one piece, uh, everything that is poles in another piece, and everything that's left over is a kinematics factory. Right, so you can always do that uh, with some work. Uh, always in terms of three valent graphs, right? So this uh, numerator C with the color numerators obey a identity, which graphically you can write in this way, which is just summing over different channels, which is just a, a, a consequence of Jacobi. So this is purely a consequence of the Lie algebra. Uh, what these people realize is that if you, if you can also find these numerators, because these numerators are not gauge invariant, so you can always modify them. So you can find a set of numerators that will be the same identity. So this call, what call color kinematic satisfying numerators. Then you can strip out the color factors and put on some numerate, some other kinematic numerators to get a new amplitude. And that amplitude is going to be some gravity amplitude. So it has the same form as before. It's, all, it's, all, it's some sum of trivalent graphs, but now it has two sets of kinematic numerators, and you can show that this is always some kind of gravitational amplitude. Right. Um, so if I just look at level three level, so no loops, this the, the proof that this is always works, and there is a bestiary of, of, of theories where you can show when you know exactly how to match spectrum between them. There is a, a recent review on the literature on that. Uh, we know that this is how also how people have been calculating high, very high loop amplitudes, up to five loops in n equals eight super gravity amplitude. And we know that it works. Uh, and it works also in all the other cases people have checked that you can always get some kind of young mills, some supersymmetric, and you can double copy, you can double copy different kinds of theories and you, you get some uh, gravitational like theory. Uh, and there's some non-perturbative generalizations, but I'm not gonna talk so much about that because I don't, you know, these tools that I'm gonna talk about, they don't say anything about the non-perturbative. But the thing is that there is no proof at loop level, and it's actually quite difficult to see how this works at loop level because these kinematic numerators are ambiguous. Well, the, the, as I said, there is ambiguity of the gauge transformations you can do. There's generalized gauge transformations, which are even non-local on space-time when you translate everything back to them. Moreover, there is ambiguity of that simply this, we can, in Feynman diagrams, we can always shift the loop momenta. So we can have different definitions of loop momenta between different diagrams. So that makes even finding them actually quite difficult uh, at loop level because you, you might find them, and you, you might not even be able to find some kinema color kinematic satisfying numerators, but they might satisfy up to something that integrates to zero. It might be difficult to see that something integrates to zero. <coughs> So we'd like to have a better handle on those kind of uh, numerators on that and really understand more fundamentally 
what kind of structures actually generate those kind of things, how you can see uh, th this kind of things. And what I want to argue is that you can use some relations from string theory uh, to see that. And this is actually a thing that is well known at three level. Three level, there's uh, monodromy relations or platter relations, things that have been known since uh, a long, long time, um, which are related to the color kinematics in the, in the field theory limit. You can see that there, and you can see there's some also some thing which is very neat, which is uh, you can see some of these BCG numerators appearing as residue theorems. So there's some recent papers on that, uh, but I'm not gonna talk so much about that. I'm gonna be more focused on this uh, monodromy relations and what they can tell. And in terms of the double copy, you can see that the people have known in terms of uh, amplitudes, there is the KLT relations from 70s, which actually tells you that you can glue together two uh, open strings to get a closed string at three level, right? So, and um, heuristically it looks like this, where you have the actual amplitude. So this is not like before where you had some decomposition into graphs. This is really the full grade invariant amplitude here. So you have a quadratic form on this uh, young mills amplitudes uh, or this closed string amplitude, sorry, open string amplitudes. Uh, you have some matrix in the middle that depends on kinematics, so it depends on monosome invariance. And you, you, you do the sum over this, over here, and you have this quadratic form that gives you directly a gravitational amplitude, so it gives you a closed string amplitude. So this was known for quite some time at three level, uh, but trying to reproduce these calculations and generalize at uh, a higher um, genus has been complicated. Uh, it, it's, um, it's messy and it hasn't been done yet. So that's something we, we would like to address eventually on that. So what I want to talk about is, is really a very specific thing, which is the field, on the field theory limit of this loop level monodromy relations. And these relations have appeared before in the literature and they appear completely in the full in, in with the correct phases in this paper by Stieberg and Cohen and we redid that and we did for higher genus and we did some other and we interpret that in terms of this homology in this other paper here. And I want to talk about uh, the field theory limit on that. On that. So, um, and of course, the, why, the, why this, this is not trivial? This is not trivial because there's new, in order to write these relations, there's the addition of the loop moment and there's some new terms that appear and those new terms, they, they are not, as I'm gonna show, they are not, related to anything that you will get from the CFD in terms of usual strings. So you have to be careful in studying the filter limit of those guys and see how everything messes together to understand how this uh, kinematic numerators appear from them. So uh, review on the monodromy relation. So this is a genus uh, zero. So as I said, they are quite old. They, they were derived by Platte by doing contour deformations long, long time ago. Um, and what they mean is that if I get some open string amplitude uh, like this, where I have all the young mills vertex operators, so everything is on the boundary of this disk, those color order amplitudes, so here I strip the color factors, so I have some ordering for the insertion of the particles. And this color order amplitudes, they are not all independent, but they have, there is a couple of linear relations between them that take with coefficients in the monodromies, basically. So the coefficients is exponential of the minus term invariance. So it has this structure where you can see that this is basically, if I start with an amplitude where one is before the true, for example, then every time one jumps a particle, it just gets a phase, which is K1 dot the moment of that particle and just accumulates that phase until it gets to zero. So it has a, a very nice and simple structure uh, out of this. Uh, so, uh, so where do they, where do they come from? Well, they, they come from really uh, the Cobanusen factor because this is the universal part. So what I didn't say is that you don't, this doesn't need necessarily have to ha be young mills amplitude necessarily because what tells you if it is an young or other kind of other kind of state amplitude, it really goes into some uh, overall function in front that doesn't have any branch cuts. The things that has branch cuts is the Cobanusen factor. And so, and so the monodromy relations really come from relations that, I, that you can derive from the combination factor out of that. So, so how we will generalize just to higher genus then? So higher genus, what you're gonna do is 
uh, you generalize the integral of parses over uh, the modular space of uh, hydrogen surface. Uh, the new thing you're going to add is that you're going to add by hand some loop momenta. And we need to do that in order to, well, to have an easier time with the analytic continuation of these things, uh, a hydrogenous. Uh, so what does that mean? That means that I pick some series of A cycles, I pick some point on the boundary and a series of A cycles that I'll meet on this point. And the loop momenta is just, uh, is just measured through this uh, A cycles here. So for each one of these internal boundaries, there is uh, an A cycle, there's a loop momentum on that. So that ends up being some extra factor in front of the copper nucleon that depends on the loop momenta like this. And here is just an realization of the combination for hydrogenous, which is gonna, it looks, this is the prime form, which basically all you need to know is that when ZI as close to ZJ, it behaves as ZI minus ZJ. So it has the same kind of local monotonies as, as this function, uh, which is the three level combination factor, right? So to be very concrete, I'm gonna talk about genus one, but everything that I say is gonna, well, I'm gonna tell you right at the very end, the only thing that doesn't generalize is, is straight away, but everything else generalizes straight away for higher units, but it's easier to visualize for units one or for the one loop, let's say. So one loop, what we're doing really is because we have only, we have two boundaries. And so I, and I have a, a, a translation invariant, so I can pick to fix one particle, uh, which I can fix at this point, And I have a loop momenta that I'm measuring along this A cycle. So because I have this loop momenta, the, the model, the space that I'm actually working on, it has been, is a cut surface. So it's not this surface, but it's really this surface. Um, so I have to take into account that the particles cannot really move because if a particle starts moving through this loop momenta, the, 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 the integrand starts uh, changing. So to, to prevent that, I work in this cut surface and that's one of the reasons why I get some uh, new things out of this structure. So, um, so what we do is, is some kind of a counter integral uh, on this um, thing. So this counter integral is just, so as I said, there is, sorry, the, the company is gonna have some branch cuts and there's a way of doing this counter integral taking account into these branch cuts, uh, which we, we did previous work with Piotr and, uh, and Sebastian we did with this kind of twisted homology, but I'm gonna be very glib about it. And, and, but if you want to talk about details, you can talk about the talk later. I can give you more details how to do it, but in essence, you do some counter integral, and the counter deformation, this counter is zero in this homology. So you end up with a sum of a bunch of terms out of this. And as you all know, the things, the, the counters are uh, where the particle is integrated along each of these boundaries. Uh, you can reinterpret this as some string theory amplitude. It's just either the part is just a planar or non-planar part of the amplitude. The particle is one boundary is another boundary. So that's well known. The new thing is that is those two uh, counters are run along the loop momenta and they don't genetically, they don't cancel. So these are new thing is that's not, as we understand any kind of string amplitude that you get out of these guys. So you can ask, uh, so this is the form. Um, you don't have to know all the details, but it essentially follows the same structure as the three level one, as particle one, which is the one I'm analytically continuing on the fiber just jumps along on particles. You, it accumulates momenta for each particle that it jumps. When it jumps a boundary, it picks up a factor of loop momenta and then keeps getting uh, more phases of particles. So this is the this is the standard part what you expect. And the new thing is, is just these counters that run along the A cycles, which are non-standard. And they have some phases that they pick up. The phases appear exactly because the integrand is not single valid. So you have to take into account when you cross branch cuts, basically. Out of that. So the filter limit of those I terms of the terms which are in one of the other boundary, this, these are well known and there's a very well known of how to extract uh, these numerators out of this, which is this, which was systematized in a series of paper by Ben Baron Kosauer and other people also out of that. So that is something that we know how to do. And the new thing that we have to be a bit careful is exactly what is this, uh, how the filter limit of this J's, which is sometimes similar to this, but it has some new things uh, that come out on that. And some of the terms that has to appear on the filter limit this, we already some conjecture uh, on this previous paper, and now we actually calculated it and show that they are, and there are also extra things that appear on, the, on that limit. So, uh, 
so what, what's the new thing? So when taking the field theory limit, because we also, because we did have this definition of the loop momenta, the nice thing that appears is that our graphs have a canonical definition of the loop momenta equation. Which, so they are not canonical for each graph. They are more or less that once I fix the loop momenta for one graph, it fixes for the other graphs in this family. Uh, just from following, uh, just from following where this loop momenta ends up being uh, measured when you go to the degenerations, right? So here I, I'm showing two degenerations of four points. So one of them just gives me uh, a square is just when the annulus gets very, very thin, but the particles don't come together. So that gives me a square. Uh, because of my definition of the loop momenta here just before one, loop momenta is always defined as coming before one, and then that fixes everything around the loop. There are other boundaries on this model space. For example, there is one where uh, as the annulus gets thin, we also have some particles colliding, in this case two and three, that strips out a very, very long cylinder. As you know, that ends up being, give me a three valent graph, which looks like this. So it splits out a three. So that becomes just a triangle. And again, the loop momenta is uh, fixed uh, just before one. So, and that's, that's an, uh, an important thing because as I said before, in the field theory, if I, if I just start with field theory, I can just, choose my loop momentum really nearly between different graphs, but then that there's this huge, huge ambiguity on how to do that. Uh, but studying this thing that's coming from the string, it gives you a handle in telling you that, well, if I fix the loop momentum for this graph, then it's going to fix the same, that is a canonical definition of loop momentum for all the other graphs, and such that these relations between string theory that descend into relation to field theory, they, uh, they are obeyed at fixed loop momentum in, in the sense that you can Put them, and we've done, done that, you can throw these relations in a computer and, and you can evaluate them and you see that you get zero. You don't get things that like, vanish after you integrate things out or things that integrate after zero, no, you get exactly zero. So it makes, it gives us a much, much better handle on this kind of things, both analytically and, and numerically. So that's what, what's important um, here. So, uh, just a, so a review of our bank or so cost over rules is that they uh, show that uh, under assumptions, you can integrate by parts such that you can get the integrand to look like something like this, which I have the propagator, which basically just means there's a simple pole when that I got the J times some other function that doesn't have a simple pole on, on that channel. And plus some function that doesn't have a simple pole. You might have high order poles, but it doesn't have a simple pole. So, this, this, when you take the field theory limit, you see that um, the, the regions in the model space that splits off a tree, if I, they, they have, uh, you, if your integrand has support, which means if it has a, a simple pole, then you, your field theory limit ends up with some coefficient, which is just, just the alpha prime goes to zero limit of this phi one. So this is going to be the kinematic numerator of this graph, for example. Uh, while, a uh, while something that is, uh, well, that is going to be where uh, i and j doesn't come close together, so it doesn't split off a tree, then it, it gives some kind of, uh, it gives you a numerator like this on the field theory limit on that. And of course, field theory limit, is, as you well know, this is just going to be a sum of a bunch of three valent graphs, but you can really track down, well, if you have a string theory in that form, you can track down all these kinematic numerators. So that's, that, that's the assumption. Um, so for this J cycles, which is the cycles that run along the A cycles, these new things, we, we can do the same kind of analysis out of that. Uh, and in this case, of course, I'm fixing all the other moduli and just looking at how uh, all the other moduli is integrated over the regular cycles, so over the one or the other boundary. So we know how to treat them. So you just really need to know exactly how, what this function behaves, which is, so is a part of the co which is, the important one. So this is just a propagator again, uh, a genus one, which again just behaves as uh, a zi minus a j uh, when zi, zi is a j are close together. That, so this is the function that we're looking and the difference from three level is that there's this loop momentum floating around here. Um, yeah, we can, you can show that this is, you can do a tropical scaling, you can show that you get the fourth line propagator of that. And if you go through all this rigmarole and all this, it's a bit, um, 
you have to be very careful with normalizations, the factor of i and factor of a half, and we, you can you go through that, and that's on our paper if you want to look at the niche and the details. But what you do find at the end of the day, if you do things carefully enough, is that on the field theory limit, so as alpha prime goes to zero, there is a, some there is a so there is some phases that appear in front of it that comes from re uh, reordering particles. And there's a phase which just looks like the usual phases that we get from a monotonous relation, something that we expect, which is just uh, i pi, some alpha prime times k i k one dot k j, so the thing, things we expect. But there's some also a new phase, which is this factor of a half that comes out in front of it. And this factor of a half can really, really be, uh, you can really see and that it, its origin really comes because you're integrating along this cycle. So if you think of this as the complex plane, so this is I, um, this is period imaginary, and this is real, it really comes because of the integrating along this real um, path and this real parameterization, this real parameter here, as opposed to I, uh, the imaginary parameter. So it's a bit funny. We didn't know how to see this straight from the string theory, but you do see it appear in the field theory limit when you do things very carefully, and you, need, you do need this factor of a half. Of course, this comes multiplied by some other graphs. Everything here is up to first order in alpha prime, so order zero in order alpha prime. We didn't look at the higher order. Well, we look at some higher order terms that vanish that we wanted to vanish, but we didn't look at higher than that. And the other interesting thing that appears is that on the set of graphs that appear here, you get some contact terms. And they are contact terms that they don't, they don't have anything to do with integrating out massive particles or anything like that. They, they are just contact terms, they are just there. And um, they, they are going to, and they do appear again because you're integrating along this funny cycle. So uh, yeah, this is what I was saying before. This phase uh, appear just because this is the usual phase that appears when the when you jump through the particles along this imaginary axis. So it's back to from the Kobanusin, but this really doesn't seem to you don't see it straight away from the Kobanusin. So so easily, but it is there in the field theory limit, and it really comes, and it's there at higher genus, and it's always going to be there, always going to have a factor of two, in just in the same form. Um, uh, right, so this, this is just how triangles uh, are generated. This is just going to jump that, and yeah, so this is how you do the field theory limit for this J cycle, so how, how do you get um, the contact terms? And the contact terms really comes because when you take the upper prime going to zero, you have to do this rescaling of the coordinates, and but you don't do a rescaling of this. So because you want to make the you you, you make the your surface very very thin, so as you're making the surface very very thin, you don't rescale the coordinates along this cycle. This cycle just just starts to come, uh, to get very, very thin. So what happens is that effectively in the limit, uh, the particles so, so the particles uh, that is being integrated along this cycle gets squeezed and when it gets squeezed if there is another particle nearby with a with a simple pool it will uh, uh, give you a triangle as you expect and that's fine uh, somehow this is really related to the gauge choice of fixing one particle we're using that translation by fixing one particle here so this might there be there or not depending on, on that gauge choice but one the thing that is always there is this um, contact term and really comes from um, from squeezing that uh, surface. And of course, if it, if it wasn't for the fact that we introduced the loop momenta by hand, so we have this cycles going through the surface, this, you, should, you won't see that in the usual field theory limit of the string, but it is there here. And it's actually very, very important uh, to, see, to see the actual constellation of all these graphs out of that uh, from this. So, and the other day, what it looks like um, generically, I said that these relations are going to look like something like this, where I have the usual field theory limit of these usual cycles where the patch is just along the two boundaries. And I have these um, new things that come from these contact terms that come when the patch goes along these A cycles here. So when I take the field theory limit, these relations on the string, uh, from the string amplitude, uh, the couples into two relations for the field theory graphs. One at uh, one at order zero and one at order alpha prime. Uh, the order zero, it's at genus one and genus two, uh, one loop and two loops. This is something that uh, has been done. Uh, people knew about them before. 
uh, in the planar case, so we, we the reproduces this previous one just in this um, because and moreover in this one don't, there is no few, there is no ambiguity in the loop momenta because as there is no phases in front of this you can just integrate out the loop momenta and this becomes the relations between amplitudes out of that. Uh, the new things are really here, which are analogous to the BCJ relations at three level. Uh, and they do have this, which they come with this contact terms and you cannot integrate out the loop momenta because the phases in front of, of these uh, terms, they might depend and they generically depend on the loop momenta. So uh, you, you have to look at what these things are and this is the big council. So this, this, is, this is, and, and this is really, where you see the BCJ relation, you see the color kinematic numerators appearing and seeing how they cancel. Uh, yeah, so this is what I was saying before, that this, this just cancel in terms of the amplitudes. Um, good. So what you see that is that this series of graphs, what happens is that because these phases conspire to give you canceled propagators among uh, uh, graphs. So, Whenever you're looking at graphs that don't sit near the boundary, so graphs that are looked on this side or the other side of the, of the, of the boundaries, but not near this A cycle that I cut, you, we, we showed, and it was known some also previously, that these phases always organize themselves in such a way that they cancel propagators. So, and they cancel propagators in triples in such a way that all of these three graphs in these three different channels, they become just this graph because I cancel the propagator times uh, the respective numerators with the right signs when you take it into account. So you see that this gives you directly, so the string theory limit, the field theory limit gives you directly um, BCJ satisfying numerators because we know that this has to be zero. So this, and there is no, nothing else that can cancel this kind of, this that has this, uh, this propagator structure. So this set of numerators have to cancel. So they have to be color kinematic dual. So that's, so that tells you straight away that in the field theory limit of these relations gives you all uh, kinematic satisfying numerators out of this. Um, the question is what happens then when you're close to this, uh, the cut cycle, and there you, you do see that you do get some console uh, propag uh, uh, propagators, but the numerators, they don't organize themselves into BCJ triples. It's something much more boring, unfortunately, where they just cancel among themselves straight away. So. You, you only get nice BCG numerators for graphs lying around these two boundaries, but once you get close, the string knows that there is a, an issue close to this, close, this uh, cut cycle, so it just cancels everything else in, ter in terms of taking into account, in terms of trying to solve this issue. And what is this issue? And this issue really comes from what's called the labeling problem, which is, is trying to keep a consistent labeling of the loop meta between diagrams as you do BCJ moves um, between them, right? So, which is exemplified in, in, in this, in that if I get the loop momenta down here and I do BCJ moves, which just means shifting the legs along different channels, uh, legs one and two, then I never touch the definition of loop momenta, right? I have uh, all the channels here and, and you have the two boxes and the three, and that's fine, I'll have to touch the loop momenta. So it's actually, um, more or less it's straightforward to find BCJ satisfying numerators for this guy, or you can, there is no ambiguity in finding them. But if I try to do BCJ moves around here to find the, BC, the graphs that are, should be related with BCJ uh, identities, uh, you start changing the definition of the loop momenta. And so these graphs don't have the same kind of propagator, so you cannot group them, uh, the numerators in the same way if you fix the loop momentum, if you require that you cannot shift the loop momentum. If you can shift the loop momentum, then it's fine, but then if you say that you can shift the loop momentum, then there is a big, big ambiguity in how to find these guys. Um, so we, were, we, we wanted to see if the string will have something to say about these identities, but it just says that from the string theory relations, it, it, these identities, we never have to consider these identities because it just cancels straight away because of the presence of these uh, J terms uh, out there. Um, so, uh, just summarize is that it was this, uh, you can get BCG identities, if you can get the string theory in this uh, Berkos representation, and that, that might be actually a very, very big assumption uh, if you can do that. But if you can do that, you, you can show straight away that you always get BCG uh, satisfying numerators away from the Js. Um, he, and, and if you're close to the Js, you can show a higher genus also that all of these contact terms, it has a bunch of new contact terms and everything just works out to cancel this uh, 
PCG numerators that, that have this labeling problem. So you, you never see them appearing on that. Uh, so as I said, a higher loops, a loops, everything, almost everything just goes through. Uh, the only new thing is that there's some new degenerations, which are uh, uh, that there's only one new degeneration that appears that you have to study. Uh, in which kind of graphs we have, a, we we, we kind of know exactly what kind of graphs appear, but we haven't shown directly from the string theory that um, that exactly without the factors of a half and an i that those are the things that are, that will then appear. Uh, and the other thing is that people in the amplitude community are interested in this BCJ relations. Uh, for um, internal loop momenta, where, where you have graphs that are so big, you have so many loop momenta that you can do uh, BCJ triple, triple by just shifting loop momenta, just graphs internal, not, not nothing along the boundary. But with these monodromy relations as they are, we don't know anything to say about that. It would be nice just if we can find something to say about that at some point. So I haven't said anything about KLT. This is still working in progress, but you, well, you can see that in this way we're doing, if you're gonna do KLT at higher genus, is gonna have to involve this uh, contact terms and even actually uh, not just that simple one, just two legs, but actually there's gonna be a, a uh, you can put as many legs uh, as, you, as you have actually on that cycle. So you have a very high valency contact term out of that. And we see that from previous work also because those kind of cycles, they have to, they, they are part of the base. You can never find some they are part of the basis of the homology. You can, you can never find a basis that doesn't contain those kind of cycles. So it seems that if there's some kind of KLT, it's gonna be related to some kind of generalized BCJ, which has been found in, has been used in the literature, this kind of generalized BCJ, which has contact terms to find, um, to find this gravity numerate, the gravity, gravity integrants, and it seems that it looks like to be unavoidable, actually a higher genus. Um, it would be nice also to use this this machinery with intersection, which I actually didn't talk much. But everything this everything done that we did, derived has to do with some previous paper we done. We talked about intersection theory on this uh, configuration space, and there's some very nice things, some of nice formulas in terms of residues uh, at level. We'd like to generalize a higher genus because you can get these generators out 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 of this. Um, but it, that's still a work in progress. So I'm going to finish a bit uh, before time and. That's it. Thank you, Eduardo, for a nice talk. Uh, now I invite the participants to ask questions. Just raise hand or just take the microphone. So one is asking so so maybe i can ask uh, so uh, i'm actually not familiar with the higher genus uh, klt formulas so 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 how does it work so so the gravity amplitude that uh, at, at some genus should should, should um, be given by by a square of gauge amplitudes at which genus at the same genus both amplitudes or different? yeah so that that's something we're still so th there's no higher genus KLT formula. That's something we are working towards using this, this framework because there is a thing as Sebastian showed that uh, like people in the maths literature knew about KLT in terms of intersection in the configuration space, uh, genus zero, mm -hmm. intersection theory. And uh, so we want to use that because in principle, there's nothing preventing you uh, from defining this intersection theory in higher genus. It's just that there are a bunch of technicalities you have to go over it, and we are still working the kinks out of that. But it, it does seem that you, one thing that you have to talk, or one thing that we, seems unavailable is that, yeah, you, you're gonna write the gravitational integrand, integrand. So what I, what I mean by integrand is that is a fixed moduli or six fixed surface moduli and fix loop momenta, I have to add, the, I do the skyward splitting, add this loop momenta by hand. And that is going to be some bilinear on the young mills integrants. Again, those, could go, those things are gonna be a fixed moduli. So the same genus surface, but at the fixed moduli and a fixed loop momenta. It seems that it's a formula like that that is gonna come out out of this formalism. But there is nothing on the literature on that yet. Other questions? So I 
think uh, while people are uh, thinking about their question, we can uh, freely move to the discussion session. Um, Hi, hey, Martin. I, I think I'm supposed to uh, moderate it, but of course you can if, you, if you're tired. No, no, no. I okay. I mean, before the, we officially start the discussion session, uh, well, let's thank all the speakers of today. <laughs> and now that it's uh, your turn. Okay, so um, 